webinar, I have the pleasure to give the floor to Mrs. Dana Bandeira, the president of INPI. Sorry, Anna, the floor is yours. Good morning to all. Dear Secretary of State for Justice, Annabella Pedroso. Dear President of the Wine and Vine Institute, Bernardo Gouveia. Dear President of the Institute of Douro and Port Wines, Gilles, I would like to start by thanking all of you for joining us in this event dedicated to geographical indications as part of the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union. This is a joint event with the Portuguese Wine and Vine Institute and the Port and Wines Institute. Also, I would like to thank everyone who was involved in helping with the organization of the event. It is an honor for me to open this webinar, Geographical Indications, the Eternalization of a Knowledge. For me, events like this, where a sharing of experience is the main goal, are a way not only to enrich everyone's knowledge about the matters under discussion, but also should be an inspiration for the improvement of the, our work. Today, our focus is geographical indications. GIs are instruments that promote rural development allowing local producers to make themselves known and protect them against infringements. And ensure the preservation of biodiversity and cultural heritage. Given their importance, the perspectives of some Portuguese agricultural GIs, such as those of the Wine and Vine Institute, the Port in Douro Wine Institute and the Minister of Agriculture are going to be shared this morning, as well as European perspectives by the EU IPO and the European Commission. The protection of our GIs is one of key elements of our economic growth. As a matter of fact, Portugal is one of the European countries with more AOs and GIs protected at the European level, with 190 registered names, including prestigious GIs such as Vinho do Porto, Vinho Verde, or Queijo Serra da Estrela. Non-agricultural GIs are equally important for the preservation of local traditions, as well as for the pot their potential for job creation. Portugal has been working towards the creation of an efficient protection system that will not only make producers more competitive, but also rise the economy of less developed regions. This is said, will also be discussed with the sharing of the experience of the two Portuguese non-agricultural products. Firstly, with Madeira's embroideries, protected as a GI since 1985. Secondly, filigrana, which was more recently protected in 2018. Portugal had an important role in Lisbon Agreement, which was originally concluded in 1958. Eight years later, in 1966, we were one of the first members to ratify it. We are forever linked to the agreement by the name of our capital city, as we can see by the name, Lisbon Agreement. More recently, the Geneva Act of the Lisbon Agreement was signed by Portugal in 2015, and we are hoping to conclude the ratification process this year. This allowed the international community to make another step towards the internationalization of GIs, extending the international register of GIs. It is also important to look at the effort 
that has been made by the EU to liberalize and promote trade and investment between its economic partners. Celebrating cultural identities outside of Europe and looking at other good practices worldwide is another important topic for us to discuss. We will have the opportunity to hear about Cape Verde's Vinho do Fogo and Brazilian uh, GI's experience. They are an important shield against the delocalization of product manufacturing while maintaining their authentic production. Authenticity has been a major challenge. The threat to products eligible as a GI is a concern that we should consider here in our reflections. But this threat is not always clear. I'm talking about those who illegitimately take advantage of the notoriety of these rights, commercializing other products similar to those protected. This courage of counterfeiting costs jobs and revenues and requires uh, answers and solutions that protect us from threats to our health and safety. I hand my speech by thanking you all of you who are joining us at this event which celebrates the sharing of knowledge of the cultural heritage left us by our ancestors. I wish you all a very productive webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for providing such an interesting overview of this webinar, which I am certain will allow us to reflect on the importance of protecting our cultur cultural assets in geographical features, honoring and promoting such a, neat, a rich heritage that we are so proud of. Let us now proceed with the contribution of Mr. Bernardo Govaya, the president of the Portuguese Wine and Vine Institute, who I'm sure knows personally the significance of GIs in the protection of unique products that cherish, cherish and reveal the richness of our country. Bernardo Govaya, the floor is yours. Good morning. I would like to welcome you and thank the organization of this webinar to the presidency of the Portuguese Institute of Industrial Property. There are more than uh, 3,000 geographical indications registered in the 27 member states of the European Union. And Portugal is an imp important contributor uh, as the, to this figure as the president of the Portuguese industrial property just noted. Each geographical indication represents a product with deep uh, local roots whose protection uh, generates significant value for its producers and the local community. Geographical indications protect against misuse or imitation of a registered name and guarantee the true origin of a product to all consumers. Geographical indications rules ensure all producers in a given geographical area collective rights over a certain type of product, as long as a certain requirements are met. Its protection supports rural development and promotes job opportunities in, in production and other related services. The future for many European farmers lies in high quality products, which maximize the value of their products and as well the global value of the European agricultural sector. The estimated sales value of geographical indication products in Europe was almost 75 billion euros in 2017. Wines accounting for 51% of this value, nearly 39 billion. Agricultural products and foodstuffs for 35%, 27 billion, 
and spirit drinks for 13%, 10 billion. Over one fifth of this amount result, results from exports outside the European, European Union. There is a clear economic benefit for producers in terms of marketing and increase of sales, thanks to the high quality and the reputation of a product with a geographical indication and due to the willingness of consumers to pay more to get the authentic product. The sales value of a product with a protected name and a geographical indication is on average the double that of a similar product without certification. Purchasing a product with a ge geographic indication label guarantees not only its quality, but its authenticity. Consumers can be sure that they are not buying an imitation because its label guarantees not only the quality, but its authenticity. The legal framework of the European geographical indications protects the reputation of regional products, promotes rural activity, helps producers obtain a premium price for their authentic products, and eliminates the unfair competition and misleading of consumers by non-genuine products, which may be of inferior quality or with a different specific flavor. More than ever, consumers require more knowledge and information about their products, particularly when it comes to authenticity. It is in consumer interests to ensure that high quality their geographical names on other products, whether in Europe or where else in the world. Protection of geographical indications products is necessary not only at the European level, but measure, measures are also needed to protect these products' names and brands from around the world and inform consumers about the authenticity of the products. Therefore, we need to push for tougher rules and control to protect the quality of regional products. If not protected under international agreements, the value, value of such products can be weakened and consumers easily shortchanged. So our mission is to look into every way possible to strengthen geographic indications, having shown their added value for producers and customers. On behalf of the Portuguese Vine and Wine Institute, I wish you all an excellent webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard Gouveia, for such an eye-opening speech. To end this opening session, please welcome Professor Gilberto Igrejas, President of the Portuguese Port Indoor Wine Institute, representing one of the most well-known and renowned Portuguese products over the centuries, Porto Endoro Wine. It is my pleasure to give Professor Gilberto Igrejas the floor. Good morning. I start by greeting Her Excellency, the Secretary of State for Justice, Mrs. Annabella Pedroso, and in her person, I greet the other participants of this webinar. I would like also to thank the National Institute of Industrial Property and Air President Anna Bandeira for inviting the IVDP to participate in this webinar and to congratulate it for bringing to debate such an important issue as geographical indications. As president of the Douro and Port Wines Institute, a state agency that has the power to control, certify, promote, and protect the designations of origin port and Douro, and representing the Douro demarcated region, which is the first demarcated and regulated wine region in 1756 in the world, I feel, we feel the responsibility 
for the protections of these names. Also, port has been used as a trade sign since 1619. The Port Wine Institute was created in 1933. In 2001, UNESCO declared the Dor Wine region as World Heritage, and Port has been classified as the best wine in the world by Wine Spectator twice. In 1997, with the 1994 Vintage Port, and in 2014, with the 2011 Vintage Port. It is clear to us that the designations of origin and geographical indications are powerful means to promote our products. The sale of wines from the demarcated Douro region in 2020 totaled a turnover of 518 million euros, of which just over 358 million euros was for export. This value of exports of DDR wines in 2020 represented 69% of total Portuguese protected marketed origin wine exports, of which 57, I repeat, 57% refers to port. The designations of origin and geographical indications are means of identifying in the marketplace products from a certain origin and quality. They are, in fact, symbols of quality. That is competition tools in a very competitive market. But more important, they are territorial mark because it is not possible to produce them in other countries with the same name. It is not poss possible to delocalize these products because they are unique. They are, in fact, unique, important tools to develop the economy of a region, besides assuring the promotion of the image of a territory, assuring economic and social sustainability, guaranteeing, if protected and promoted, a fair standard of living for the agriculture community, protecting the cultural and the gastronomic heritage and being a tool to promote the rural development and the maintenance of the rural population. All these functions cannot be accomplished if we do not protect our names, our designations of origin with a high level of protection and promotion in order to increase their value. In other words, ensure a fair standard of living for the agriculture community. In particular, by increasing the individual earnings of persons engaged in agriculture, as the Lisbon threat says. GIs are, in fact, a European success and an example for the world. Several European studies demonstrate the added value that GIs represent. So we must continue our path to improve the value of our designations of origin and geographical indications. In this sense, we, as the Douro and Port Wines Institute, will continue to increase our work. That is our mission on the worldwide protections of the designations of origin, Port and Douro, because it is a global protection that we want to achieve for a sign that is a symbol of quality and high level of reputation and prestige. I'm sure that this webinar will strongly contribute to the enrichment of our knowledge of this subject. Congratulations to you all to attend this important meeting and thank you very much. Thank you so much for your insightful speech.
dear Professor Gilberto Igrejas. We now reach the first panel of our webinar that is dedicated to agriculture geographical indications, focusing on the importance role they play in society and, of course, in the economy. Now, I give the floor to the uh, ergonomic engineer, Mrs. Maria João Fernandes Pires, representing the Portuguese Wine and Vine Institute. E agora carregar aqui para, para o fim. De, designations é. of origin and geographical indications é. in the wine. Ok. Mas, mas espera, uh, primeiro aparece a vida com o Mónica. Iniciar o vídeo. Aqui, iniciar. Ah, não, não, não estou a Aqui, olha. Iniciar. E agora? Good morning to all. Uh, the Vine and Wine Institute is a public institute forming part of the indirect administration of the state, which has uh, administrative and financial autonomy. Uh, it performs the tasks of the Ministry of Agriculture under the supervision of the respective minister. Uh, as missions and tasks, uh, uh, the institutional uh, organization of the winemaking set, auditing the quality certification system following the EU policy and preparing the rules for applying it, participating in the coordination and supervision of the promotion of uh, wine products and ensuring the functioning of the National Commission of the International Organizations of Vine and Wine, uh, uh, OAV. Um, this is a, a, a the main relationships uh, between IVV and the other entities, uh, such as the IMPI, uh, the GAF, for instance, is the national coordinator, coordinator for control plans. The IPAC is the National Institute of Accreditation, the certification bodies, and the economic agents. We have also uh, cooperation with ASAI, and Iga Maot that supervise uh, and audit uh, the IVV. Uh, in the IVV, we have an advisory council uh, that supports and participates in the activity of the governing board uh, to define the general lines of the wine and sector policy. Uh, we have uh, vine and wine producers, wine cooperatives, wine trade, certification bodies, and distilleries. They all make, they, they all uh, have opinions, issue opinions uh, concerning the wine market situation and organization, and uh, the law, uh, the national and EU relevant uh, legislation. Uh, we have also an, an important uh, tool. The SIEV is the system, uh, is an information system designed to better respond to the vine and wine economic uh, agent necessities uh, with simplification, greater transparency, and rationalization of the administrative procedure. SIEV has allowed to receive and release information in a faster and better way within SIV and also with other external information systems. Uh, for instance, we receive in SIV the harvest or production declarations and stock declarations, which uh, uh, the monthly, monthly declarations of wine taxes, the monthly declarations of wine taxes 
that are provided by the certification bodies, the accompanying documents, the certificates of origin, the constitution of wine batches allowed to indicate variety and vintage on the label. They are not PDI or PGI wines. The operator's inscriptions, consultation register, the facilities, wine plots, and so on. Uh, in Portugal, uh, mainland and, and islands, we have globally 14 PGIs and 31 PDOs. Uh, the, minister, the Minister of Agriculture assigns a certification body for each PDO PGI to ensure the, the origin of the products and its specific characteristics. So we have technical standards that regulate the production of wine products, PDO PGI, increasing the economic value while maintaining the quality and traditional practices that characterize those wines. Geographical area, grape varieties, production techniques, and some other uh, rules. Uh, globally, and uh, in a short way, this is the, the, the main control system for wine sector. Uh, IGAMAWAT um, makes the external audits to IVV. Uh, IVV received annual activity reports from the control bodies and the information sharing by uh, control bodies on infringements. Uh, for the other, uh, uh, in global, uh, EVV produces uh, legislation, pro proposes le legislation, the planning, the coordination, and do also some the audits and controls. We have control bodies. They all are accredited by the, the ISO uh, 1765. And uh, the control bodies have uh, labs, proper or uh, contracted. Uh, they all have uh, uh, labs uh, accredited by the ISO 1725. IPAC is the organism that accredits the control bodies and the labs. And we have in the control bodies all the economic agents that uh, uh, work uh, in this uh, job. The, as IVV is a competent uh, authority for the wine sector, uh, IVV coordinates the control plan for the wine uh, sector, PDO and PGI, monitors a uh, policy and prepare rules for its implementation, and participates on the coordination of the promotion of wine products. The controls on products with protected names, PDO and PGI, due to various changes, uh, they, they implement, the implementation of the on, on ground of the control plan was carried out uh, last year. IVV delegated the controls and the certification of wine products to regional control bodies, and those control bodies send information when asked and also uh, have to uh, send uh, annual activity reports to be submitted to IVV. We, all, we also uh, work in cooperation with uh, Portuguese uh, Institute for Accreditation. And uh, as this entity uh, is the entity that certify uh, that accredits the control bodies, um, all the lots. This is a, an important uh, info, uh, info, info, information for for in, from our side that uh, in Portugal all the lots that are submitted to physical and sensorial analysis. And uh, some of those test chambers are already accredited according to the uh, norm uh, ISO 1725. Uh, 
the certification bodies are recognized. It, it, it is uh, they are uh, recognized entities that meet the requirements defined in the specifications approved by the Minister of Agriculture. They certify wine products, SPDO and PGI. They promote, defend, and manage the PDO and the PGI products, uh, both for wines and uh, uh, spirits, and other legally established functions. They can be public as institutes like IVDP and IFPAM, and interbranch associations governed by private law, which represents all the operatives wishing to produce wine and wine products. A certification body, uh, in Portugal we call it CVR, was designate, designated for each PDO and PGI. However, the control bodies can manage and certify various PDOs within the PGI. The products from vine and wine sector that are eligible for PDO and PGI certification are subject to a compliance with production and trade specific rules. Certification schemes uh, should ensure the complete, the complete traceability of the product and at any stage of the row from the vineyard to the bottle placed on the map. Verifying also the product in terms of food safety and geographic origin. Controls tests are made in 100% uh, of the lots eligible for certification, as well as their labeling. More than but also physical, like stock count of products, bottle with and without label, and also in bulk, security seals, physical and sensory analysis with sample collection to compare with the approval information of a lot, and verification of the conformity of the information on the label. And now uh, I present to you the generic uh, certification scheme. Uh, Firstly, we have the vineyard suitable for PDO and PGI wine production. Then we have to, to have a correct harvest production declaration. Uh, in, the, in the entity, they have to open a current account for suitable PDO or PGI wines. So we have the application for the certification of a batch wine samples. Uh, the, the samples go to lab, lab and uh, uh, laboratory analysis, uh, both physical chemi and chemical and sensory. If they are approved, they have an, uh, an open current account for certified, certified, uh, certified PDO PGI wines. Then uh, we have also the questions uh, related to labeling. If the labeling is approved by the entity, they, uh, the, the operators can uh, demand the, uh, the requisition of quality stamps. And then all these go to the bottling, labeling, marketing trade. And then the consumers have uh, the, the, the products in, in uh, 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 compliant. Um, concerning the the certification, we have also uh, some uh, new forms of organization we have to, to change with a new law also. Uh, and uh, as public, uh, public uh, policy objectives associated with a new legal framework, it is recommended to deepen uh, the level of legal, legal protection, the PDO, PGI, and the uh, reinforcement of self-regulation based on the interprofessionalism model to have a greater requirement and scrutiny as regards the management and certification of products and to incorporate into national law all the community rules governing recognition, protection, and control. 
The community rules require that the designation of a competent authority for the management of the PDO PGI and another independent control body responsible for verifying the compliance and the requirements of the product specification and consequent pro product uh, certification. The managing entities, e.g., e uh, they perform functions that are delegated by the state, assuming a central role in the operation in the entire region. They are clearly established, the legal nature of these entities, the form of representation of its oper oper operators within it, guaranteeing its primacy in all the initiatives taken regard the rules and strategy of the regions. The, mon the model of representativeness of operators in the general councils of the uh, managing entities, the PDO and PG, or PG, PGI, is the most important requirement for strengthening the le legitimacy of these entities in decision-making with impact across the board. Certain uh, or, or horizontal principles apply to all PDO and PGI management uh, entities have flexibly, uh, flexibility to define complementary rules that should be transparent, objective, and non-discriminatory to be included in their statutes and their electoral re uh, regulations. The management entities may choose to continue to accumulate management and certification functions subject to certain conditions of impartiality and internal segregation. They may have an outsourced certification constituting for this purpose a certification consortium with other PDO PGI or contracting this function to another sector certifying, certifying body. The new rules foster a greater capacity for controls and intervention by the control bodies and the certification bodies and eliminate the burden imposed by previous legislation on smaller financial and administrative PDO PGI. The state, through the Institute of the Vine and Wine Institute, ensures the supervision of the control board. According to the CAP reform in the European Union, the common agriculture policy aims a competitive agricultural sector, especially with the farm to fork, fork strategy, with a strong sustainable component in which designations of origin and geographical indi indications ensure a system that makes possible a comprehensive communication of the quality products with designations of origin, PDO, and geographical indications, PGI, the diversity of the agri agriculture production through the promotion of the quality systems as an important factor for the producer's competitive advantage, to reinforce the value for local communities through products that are deeply based in tradition, culture, and geography to reinforce the important contribution to our cultural heritage and to enhance the position of farmers in a stable economic future. Uh, and I thank you for, uh, for uh, I thank you for this. Thank you, Maria João, for a very interesting insight wow. on, the import, in the, on the importance of agriculture, agriculture geographical indication, particularly in the wine step. Still on the subject of the importance of agriculture and geographical indications, I now have the opportunity to open the floor to Professor Alberto Ribeiro de Almeida, 
representative of the Portuguese Porto Endoro Institute, who will share his thoughts on evocation and parasitism. Professor Alberto Ribeiro de Almeida, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the invitation that was addressed to me by the Portuguese Office of Industrial Property. It's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, with you in this uh, seminar. Allow me to give a special salute to all my colleagues and friends that are here in this uh, uh, seminar. Well, I'm, I'm going to um, give some examples of um, evocation and uh, parasitism that worries um, the most prestigious and uh, reputed uh, geographic indications and designation of origin. And then let's start with this uh, image that uh, that you can see. It's um, chocolate. Um, almost everybody loves chocolate. Well, matching dark chocolate with vintage port is wonderful. It's a wonderful matching, in fact. But uh, putting port inside a chocolate and call it uh, uh, chocolate port will damage uh, the prestige of the uh, place of origin port. Uh, so uh, pair, it's a wonderful pairing this, but do not blend both. That's another thing. Uh, so let's start with some examples, uh, more or less recent examples of evocation and presidism. The first case I give to you concerns uh, evocation of uh, the uh, designation of origin Manchego. Uh, well, there has been several decisions from the European Court of Justice concerning evocation and the meaning of uh, evocation. We're not going through all of that detail, don't have that time. But what happened in this case is the following. Um, a producer uh, based in uh, La Mancha, in the region of La Mancha, was producing a cheese, but this cheese didn't comply with uh, the specification. And useful. Uh, there was no reference to La Mancha or to Manchego in uh, the label of uh, the cheese that uh, this producer was, was making. But there were other images on the label. There was the image of, uh, the image of uh, Don Quixote de La Mancha, created by Cervantes, as we know. <clears throat> it was the name, there was the name of uh, its horse, Rocinante. The images <clears throat> of the landscapes of La Mancha and its famous windmills. Uh, also, the shield that was used by, by Don Quixote, uh, Adarga. So there were several uh, figurative signs that, uh, in, a, uh, in a way that the court has qualified, uh, evoked the designation of origin Manchego. This means that there were no visual or phonetic similarity with uh, the designation of origin Manchego, and that's the word that is protected by the registration of uh, this designation of origin according to the European Union rules. Uh, but the court, uh, uh, in any case, understood that there was an evocation or that it was possible to have an evocation through or using these images, these figurative signs, because there could be a conceptual proximity. So no visual proximity, no phonetic similarity, but a conceptual proximity. It's interesting to underline that this producer was established in La Mancha. So this, produced, uh, this producer uh, was in fact inside the region where Manche was produced, uh, but uh, uh, the products that he, he produced were not in, in accordance with, uh, with uh, the, the specification. So he could not use the word La Mancha or the word uh, Manchego, it's the appellation of origin, but uh, he used instead indirect references to uh, the region, uh, images, uh, figurative signs, and the court understood that this could be an evocation of the designation of order of the region, first of all, and then of the designation of origin, uh, Manchego. It's a very interesting case. Uh, and it was a development of uh, the jurisprudence, the case law by the uh, European Court of Justice. The second case, more recent, is also concerning a cheese, Morbier, uh, PDO, uh, protected, a decision from December last year. Uh, this uh, cheese, uh, according to the specifications, has a certain shape, has a certain appearance, 
uh, especially this uh, central black line that you can see there in the in, in this slide is a distinctive a very distinctive uh, uh, sign that is black or blue a mark that is central on the cheese and what happened was the following uh, there was a, a, a producer of cheese that produced the cheese without the PDO Morbier. There was no reference to the PDO uh, Morbier in any case, but uh, the, the, the cheese had the same shape and visual appearance, namely the blue horizontal line that you can see over there. So uh, the court had to uh, wonder if uh, this line, this appearance, this shape, the whole thing would be also uh, considered uh, uh, not really an evocation in this case, but if the consumer could be misled, uh, taking into account uh, the legal functions of a PDO, that is uh, origin and quality. If uh, uh, using this line and other, uh, the whole shape and appearance of uh, the cheese could be a way to uh, uh, to mislead the consumer as to the origin or to the quality of uh, uh, the product that this uh, producer was, was making. So uh, once again, the name that is protected is Morbier and only that, not the shape, not the, uh, um, the appearance of the product, but uh, the court said that in any case, the, this reproduction of the appearance of the shape of the product especially, as I said, this, this blue horizontal line, uh, could, uh, uh, would be liable to mislead the consumer as to the true origin of the product, and I would say as to the characteristics, the quality characteristics also of the product. Of course, it is important to underline that the court said that this element, this blue black line, blue or more or less black line, horizontal line, had to be a, a characteristic uh, uh, clearly important and uh, particularly distinctive in order uh, to mislead a consumer as to the characteristics or to the origin of uh, uh, the cheese. In any case, it was a step further uh, made by the court once again uh, that uh, PDOs and all the European law and the protection of PDOs and PGIs uh, would also prohibit the reproduction of a shape or uh, the appearance, uh, namely the special characteristics that are particularly distinctive in a product, uh, would also uh, be forbidden, uh, taking into account the scope of protection uh, considered by uh, the European Union law uh, on the protection of PDOs and PGRs. It's also a very interesting case uh, because, it's, as I said, it's a step further on the protection of uh, PDOs and PGRs. A certain example that is still pending, it is not decided yet, we have from uh, last week's the opinion of the Advocate General, so it is this opinion that I'm going to take into account, uh, concerns the use of the word champanillo uh, by uh, restaurants, uh, tapas bar and similar services, not in product but in services, uh, in Catalonia. Uh, in Spain. Uh, so this name, uh, Champanillo, and also the use of the two glasses that are making a toast, if I may so say in this way, uh, that cut general proposed that the court should uh, uh, rule in a way that uh, the European law also protects PDOs, in this case Champagne, uh, against any parasitic commercial practices whether they relate to, to products and services. It is a, a quite interesting how the Advocate General underlines these uh, parasitic uh, practices or this parasitism uh, way of using famous names because it's always concerns, always concerns uh, prestigious and reputed uh, designation of origin. And uh, the Advocate General underlined that uh, the uh, European Union law uh, prohibits any practices relating to goods or services, it does not matter, which are aimed to uh, take and do advantage of the reputation of the PDO uh, through a mental association. So there could be a mental association between the word Champanillo and all the insignia or advertisement that is made by uh, this uh, applicant, this user, not an applicant, in fact, this user of the name Champanillo. 
and uh, uh, taking all into account that is uh, there is a partial visual and phonetic similarity between Champanillo and uh, Champagne, of course. There is, according to the Advocat General, a strong conceptual similarity between both. And probably the tapas bar and restaurants also sell a champagne or sparkling wines. Uh, Take into account also this uh, uh, insignia and the advertisement that uh, uh, these, uh, uh, these owners of the restaurants and bars and so on are using uh, 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 so the, the, uh, the two glasses that are making a toast. Clearly, the, uh, the Advocate General concludes that there is a high risk of uh, evocation. It's important to, to underline that uh, um, the general, uh, the Advocate General uh, said that evocation <clears throat> does not uh, require uh, that there is uh, any kind of uh, competitive relationship uh, between, in this case, uh, sparkling wines uh, and, uh, on the other hand, uh, services. So it is not necessarily uh, to have a, a competitive relationship between both products and services. On the other hand, it also it is not also necessary that there is a likelihood of confusion on the part of the consumer. So it's not necessary to uh, consider if the consumer will be misled or not. That's not the point. Also, it is not important if this ev ev evocation was intentional or not intentional. Well, the matter is if in the end, in fact, there is evocation or not in this case of the appellation of origin uh, champagne. Uh, so if uh, the court will decide in a turn similar to this opinion of the Advocate General, it's another step on the protection of uh, designation of foreign GIs uh, related in this case to services that uh, uh, evoke the uh, designation of foreign in this case, designation of foreign champagne. Of course, uh, coming from the Doe region, I could not um, forget the population of foreign port and how it is protected. Port is a, a high reputed and prestigious designation of origin all over the world. As the, the IVDP president, uh, president underlined in the beginning, the word port is being used since the beginning of the 17th century. And uh, it's been used on exports since the 17th century all over the world. Uh, so uh, in fact, it has a reputation, authority, and especially a high level of prestige. I chose two cases, there are uh, several, uh, two cases and two decisions from the European Union Integral Property Office, uh, which I must, uh, must underline that uh, the Integral Property Office has in the, in the last decisions, uh, concerning not only port, but also cognac, uh, champagne, has recognized the, uh, uh, the, prestigious, uh, the prestige and the reputation of these uh, um, designation of origin of these industrial property rights and has protected this name against uh, other uh, other uses, even in non-comparable products or services. It's important to underline that uh, the European Union Tech Property Office has, uh, in fact, taken uh, interesting and important decisions on the protection of uh, these, especially these uh, designation of origin. Not only these, but, but I would like to underline these ones. So concerning these two examples, that I have chosen. Uh, the first one is already has already some time. Deport of Fino, it was an application for the registration of a European trademark, uh, Deport of Fino, for completely different products like coffee, rice, bread, ice cream, honey, salt, and so on. And uh, uh, the European Union, in fact, property office at that time didn't have the, this name, but well, that is not a point important for, for, for today. Uh, underline that the applicant would benefit from the fame of the traditional place of origin uh, Porto, it would take unfair advantage of the distinctive character and the prestige of the place of origin. The second case is from uh, last week, so it's not uh, yet uh, uh, judicata. Uh, so uh, the other part may uh, appeal from this decision, but uh, uh, it's very interesting in any case, of course, very interesting to underline what uh, the European Union Intellectual Property Office said about this uh, trademark application, the port house for restaurants, uh, bistro, coffee shop, uh, snack bar services, hotels, and so on. Uh, so it's, uh, it's an application for services that includes the word uh, port uh, completely 
So, uh, and it's interesting to underline that uh, the European Union Tech Property Office was very clear. The applicant of this trademark would benefit from the transfer of the image, the distinctive character and qualities of the PDO port. The applicant would exploit the reputation of the Appalachian of origin port. The applicant would take advantage of this reputation. And finally, the applicant, if this sign was considered, would uh, take advantage of the use of this uh, name, port, uh, among its, com its competitors. How, so uh, he would, uh, using this name, have more commercial success uh, in selling his services because he's using a famous uh, appellation of origin. It's a, a, a very interesting decision, this one of uh, concerning the pot house, uh, with uh, wonderful grounds on the protection of uh, a place of origin and she is the most prestigious ones. But what are really the uh, legal consequences of these uses, uses of uh, the words, uh, designations, port, champagne, cognac, in several products or services, non-comparable products and complete different uh, services? Well, there are several consequences. I would uh, especially underline four uh, consequences. First, uh, the risk of dilution by blurring. That is dilution that destroys the, uh, the connection that we have between port and, uh, uh, and the fortified wine, between champagne and uh, a sparkling wine. It would lose its brightness because the, 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 the designation would be used in so many different products or services that it would lose its, its identity. It would lose, uh, it would be a dissipation or dispersion of that identity. And of course, it would weaken the reputation of uh, and the prestige of the appellation of origin. Second uh, consequence or possible consequence, dilution by tarnishment. That is bad associations. Imagine that uh, we find a, a, a chocolate port or a, a, a sorbet champagne that has bad quality. So that would create bad associations. The consumer would uh, make a bad association with the designation of origin uh, port or champagne in these cases that I'm giving the examples. Uh, or if you are facing products that are incompatible, uh, just imagine using the name champagne or port in services of rat removal or disinfection or transport of waste. This would create creative asso negative associations with the designation of origin port and champagne. In this case, we could give up other examples. And this has a long history in the, uh, the case law in several European Union countries, but uh, let's go forward. Um, third consequence that could, could uh, uh, also damage the uh, appellation of origin or designation of origin is the fact that uh, allowing the use of the names, uh, famous uh, GIs in complete different products would uh, uh, most probably in most of the cases, there are several uh, prerequisites here to take into account that I don't have the time to go through all of them, but uh, it would take unfair advantage of uh, the designation of origin. It would be an exploitation of the reputation. We're trying here to fight free riding attitude. Someone is taking advantage of the name uh, of this distinctive power uh, that others have built other has uh, other have built this reputation and uh, this prestige and so the user of the name is uh, profiting from this uh, renown of the designation of origin of course uh, this would influence the choice of the consumer in favor of uh, the parasite it would facilitate its commercial success i always give the example if uh, i produce pencils and i have a competitor that also produces pencils but he uses his own trademark and I use the name Rolls Royce, for example, of course I would have my commercial success easily done than my competitor. And this also happens here. Uh, I always remember, allow me a, 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 a more second, I always remember a case uh, two years ago of a producer of chocolate that uh, used the name Port on the chocolate. And when we forbid that uh, through the, the, the courts, he said to us, without an import, 
I will not sell any chocolate at all. Without an import, I will have to close my company. So, without an import, he cannot sell chocolate. And that is what we are here trying to avoid, is this parasitic uh, uh, um, exploitation of the designation of forage, in this case, pork. Finally, a uh, fourth argument, uh, these uses would contribute to uh, the transformation of the designation of forage into a generic term or sales denomination. Just imagine, uh, uh, it's, of course, I'm taking into account here the, the court uh, decision on the Champagne uh, Sorbet. Uh, we're not going through that today, of course. If uh, it was allowed to use uh, uh, Sorbet Champagne and side by side we had a, a, a Sorbet Strawberry, so a generic term, strawberry, of course, uh, champagne would be used also as a generic term, or port chocolate side by side with chocolate with almonds. Uh, so port will be used, is being used as a generic term. But I'd like to, to ask, uh, just, uh, just to give that to, to, to all that are listening to us, would uh, Heineken allow cookies named Heineken because they have a, a beer inside the cookies? Or would uh, Coca-Cola allow an ice cream named Coca-Cola because it contains 10% uh, of Coca-Cola, for example? Well, uh, to, end, uh, to end this point, the problem is not protecting the consumer or misleading the consumer. The problem is protecting the investment that has been made through years, generations, centuries in some cases. The investment that has been made by producers and traders of a region. It's necessary to protect the selling power of the designation of forage and GIs. And of course, this only happens when we are facing designation of forage or GIs that have great distinctive power. Uh, so in the end, what we are protecting is the value of the designation of forage or GI. Uh, what we are uh, uh, trying to avoid is, uh, from, uh, is losing the value and market is that that we are protecting and i would end i think I, my 10 minutes are over i would end by remembering what a parasite is and the word parasite comes from the greek and of course the word has uh, uh, over the time the significance of this word has changed uh, but uh, uh, it means in greek according to the, the origin of the word a person who eats out the table of another uh, this, this has some history, I don't have the time to explain the history of the parasites in the ancient Greece, but in the end it is this. And the parasite is one that lives and only can live on the, uh, on the host. Uh, so uh, uh, he takes advantage of the host, but does not kill the host. Uh, so he takes advantage of the host and can only live inside the, that host organism but does not kill them because you do not kill the chicken that lays the golden eggs. And that's the point here. So what we're trying to uh, avoid always is this exploitation, these uh, acts of taking advantage of the investment, the creativity, the reputation, the, pr the prestige that others have uh, uh, developed and that uh, those that try to use that famous uh, designation of foraging uh, have uh, are taking advantage of this uh, this reputation in order to succeed in the market that otherwise would be much more difficult. So it is protecting this identity. It is protecting the value of uh, the uh, designation of foraging. It is also protecting the regions and the producers that we uh, take these measures. And thanks to uh, the uh, recent positions taken by the European Union Tax Property Office and by the European Court of Justice, it has been easier to protect our names and the prestige that these names have. Thank you very much for your attention and the congratulations for this uh, initiative, for this uh, seminar. Uh, thank you uh, very much.
I think we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. Without sound, without sound. Still not hearing. Problems here. I would like to thank you, dear Professor Ribeiro de Almeida, for such a clear and comprehensive presentation. Now, let's hear the contribution of the researcher of the National Institute for Agriculture and Veterinary Research, INIAV, Dr. Sara Canas, Master in Viticulture and Oranology, and specialized in, in food engineering, sorry, who will present a case study contribution of the research carried out at Estação Vinifinícola Nacional, INIAV, to the Lourinhã Appellation of Origin. Sara, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Maria João Siabra from INPI for the invitation to this webinar and for the presentation. For me, it's a pleasure uh, to participate and have the opportunity sorry, and have the opportunity to talk about the contribution of the research carried out at EVN in IAV to the Lourinhã designation of origin. Lourinhã is a small region uh, in the coastal zone of Portugal, 70 kilometers north of Lisbon. In the past, um, Lourinhã um, was known for producing uh, a large amount of wine spirit sold to port wine companies to stop the fermentation of these, these liquorous wine. Nowadays, this region has only about 40 uh, hectares of vineyards and two economic operators, Adega Cooperativa da Lourinha and Quinta do Rol. But they have more than 10,000 liters per year of a certificate and remarkable wine, aged wine spirit. Regarding the wine spirit production, the technological uh, process comprises, uh, at, uh, uh, in the beginning, the, the wine making, so the production of wine for this purpose, then uh, a distillation step, um, aging, uh, in which the oak wood from the French region of Limousin is traditionally used, then blending, uh, that is mixing different uh, wine spirits from different uh, wooden barrels, uh, followed by dilution with water to um, decrease the alcoholic content to the value required for commercialization, and finally, filtration and bottling. Regarding the research, uh, it was made uh, in three steps. The first one from 19... Uh, 70 to 1995, then uh, a second stage from 1996 to 2005, focused on the aging by the traditional technology using uh, wooden barrels. And then a, second, a third stage from 2007 on, focused on alternative technologies. It should be highlighted that uh, the research uh, work was carried out by INIAV, Estação uh, Vitivinícola Nacional, 
in close connection with Adega Cooperativa da Lourinha. In, the, uh, in this first stage, um, studies were made on the distillation system to find the most appropriate for this wine spirit production and just a bit of the aging process, which allowed report, reporting the suitability of the Lourinha region for the production of high quality aged wine spirits. And then the research continued. So in 1992, the Lourinha designation of origin was created based on the scientific work made. As, and as you can see in this, in this figure, nowadays Portugal has eight designations of origin for wine spirits. But Lourinha stands out from the others because it is exclusive uh, as the French regions of Cognac and Armagnac for wine spirit. Therefore, to the best of our knowledge, uh, these three regions are unique in the world as a result of their terroirs uh, and the techn technological process of wine spirit production. For this reason, we devote uh, our research to this Portuguese deal. In the, in the second stage after uh, 1996, uh, we, we start a deep investigation on the traditional aging process through three projects in which the influence of several factors and phenomena were studied and to, to uh, examine the, um, their, their effect on the chemical composition and sensory properties of the aged wine spirit. Uh, several kinds of, of oaks, including uh, Limousa oak, and for the first time, chestnut wood, which is an important uh, species in uh, Mediterranean countries, uh, were studied. of the barrel resulting from an operation of the barrel, barrel making process, the seasoning of the chestnut wood in cooperage, the barrel size, uh, and some phenomena occurring during aging, such as evaporation, were also analyzed. Um, it, it was also created a tasting panel of fine spirits uh, uh, for INIAV, uh, which uh, still works. The main results uh, obtained were the high potential of chestnut wood for the aging of fine spirits together with medium or heavy toasting level and two barrel sizes. Because these conditions allowed producing high quality wine spirits by a faster aging process. Indeed, uh, chestnut wood has specific chemical and um, specific chemical and anatomical features that favor the aging of wine spirits. And in addition, um, it promotes uh, um, um, a cheaper aging because this, this wood is less valued in the market. So the barrels are cheaper than those of oak wood. In this figure, you can see um, the color acquired by the same Lorigna wine spirit after two years of aging in barrels of different kinds of wood with, combined with three toasting levels. It's evident uh, the faster evolution of the wine spirit aged with chestnut wood, regardless of the toasting level. In addition, the higher the toasting level, the higher the faster the color evolution. And similar results were obtained for chemical and um, sensory characteristics. So this knowledge uh, was transferred to producers, academy and society at national and international levels. And recently, uh, in uh, 2018, the OEV published our work about chestnut wood in its website in recognition of the excellence of the research made. I would like to stress that these actions were 
important, very important to spread the best technological practices, but also to increase the visibility of Lourinha wine spirit. In addition, uh, since the European regulation does not impose the, the use of oak wood for the aging of wine spirits, we worked with CVR Lisboa, a control body for this region, to update the Lourinhan DO statutes, which only allowed uh, oak wood to be used by the producers. And now, uh, from to, to 2021, uh, the producers of Lorignan Dio can also use chestnut wood uh, for the aging of wine spirit, which is a great achievement for all. And this, this fact clearly shows the importance of the research for a Dio. Although the, the great interest of the traditional technology using uh, wooden barrels to produce premium wine spirits, it has some drawbacks. Uh, it is time consuming. The invested capital uh, returns to the producer over the long term. There is a great loss of wine spirit by evaporation, which is called at the angel share. Uh, there is a high demand for wood, which is a natural resource with limited availability. And so there is a need to increase the production efficiency and the producer's profitability, to use resources more efficiently and also to innovate, differentiate, and add value to the final product. To meet the consumers and the producers' expectations. Thus, alternative technologies have been investigated towards a more sustainable aging for the Lernia wine spirit. In this context, from 2007 on, our team studies these uh, technologies using wood fragments, such as staves and dominoes um, of uh, chestnut and uh, limousin oak wood, uh, separately or simultaneously inside stainless steel tanks, uh, combined uh, with uh, micro oxygenation. At this moment, we have two ongoing projects, the Oxyribrand one, uh, in which uh, different uh, levels of microoxygenation combined with staves are under study. And I invite you to, to visit the, this project um, website in the uh, INIAV platform. And we are still uh, doing um, the, some research under the project Centro uh, Vint Vint, the second phase, um, in which the, the validation of the alternative aging technology is being done uh, along with the study of blending operation. The knowledge transfer um, to producers, uh, academy and society has been made through several actions. Uh, such as the open day of the project Oxyribrand at the Dega Cooperativa de Lourinha, articles published uh, in technical and scientific journals, communications in conferences, among others. Last but not least, uh, I present the team that made this research work possible since 1970, and I express my gratitude to all of them. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you, Sara, for sharing the results of your innovative research. To end this first panel of agricultural geographical indications, I now have the honor to introduce 
the European Union Intellectual Property Office legal specialist, Mrs. Katerina Kompari, who has an, ex an extensive expertise in the GIs area. Katerina is a team leader of no the Knowledge Circle Geographical Indications and coll Collective Rights and will give us the European perspective of agriculture GIs. Katerina Kompari, I am honored to offer you the floor. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, Portugal. Dear organizers, dear fellow speakers and honored participants, it is a distinguished pleasure to be called here today to speak on the behalf of the EUIPO. The EUIPO finds itself in a fortunate position when it comes to geographical indications, as we do feel we can make a difference. We are here to help strengthen the GI schemes through various means and ways. For some years now, in cooperation with the Commission, we have been jointly exploring the interface between trademarks and geographical indications in a focused dialogue. The cooperation between the EU IPO and the Commission is a striking example of how we are stronger together within the EU family. In the last GI conference, organized jointly by the Commission's DG Agri and the EU IPO, the office wanted to show that we do share and we have an interest in all intellectual property rights. In the end, all the IPR rights have close links. The owners or users of the various rights often treat them in a bundled fashion and expect them to work together in the world of business and commerce. Indeed, a good part of the value of the GIs is are also supported by the trademarks of brands that depend upon them for their success. In this cooperative and knowledge sharing context, the Commission and the EU IPO have explored different ways to enhance the visibility of the GIs, to strengthen their position as the IPRs, and to build capacity for mutual understanding of different yet linked intellectual property rights. I will first we have been cooperating on the pre-examination of agriculture GI rights applications, always under the authority, obviously, of the DG Agri, and this is now an established aspect of the office's work. I hope you will all agree that this makes good sense since the protection of the IPR rights has many facets, and in the examination of trademarks, for example, we look to see if there is any conflict with the geographical indication. So it is crucial for us to understand GIs, not only as registered intellectual property rights, but also on the process that precedes it to see how the GIs come about. On my second point, on the lines of strengthening the GIs as IPR rights, well, as the European Union Intellectual Property Office, we are called upon to give protection to GIs when registering other intellectual property rights, such as trademarks and designs. And we are doing it diligently. For this purpose, the office has established several expert groups and a knowledge circle, all bringing together different profiles of people within the office, but all with the same aim, to have the means to raise the awareness within the office on the importance of the geographical indications. As you are all aware, the office has several departments and we had to make sure that the knowledge on the geographical indications is equally spread throughout these departments, but this is just the beginning. The office regularly offers through our webinars, which are open to the public and can be visited at any time through the available recordings, a plethora of content on the protection of the geographical indications. Not only do we inform about the decisions of the office, but we regularly update on the latest case law. As we all know, the GA scheme at the EU level is currently regulated through four different regulations, which, as you can imagine, requires an excellent understanding of the GA context. In the end, we should all not forget that geographic indications are not only intellectual property rights, but they are indeed is expression of the cultural heritage. Looking further afield, the office is also involved in initiatives dealing with GI protection in third countries, included in the EU funded projects that we implement on behalf of the Commission in most major global regions. In parallel, our own IP enforcement portal 
provides enforcement authorities with information from right holders that facilitates the identification of counterfeits. Speaking of which, and in respect to visibility and transparency of the geographical indications, one of the innovations and most striking results of the cooperation with DGAGRI is that we have worked together to create a new online tool that will help bring transparency to agricultural GIs and would allow for the connection with the IP enforcement tool. And we are hoping indeed that the non-agri GIs in the future will be following the suit as well. The GIVU database contains agricultural GIs at the EU level, the agricultural GIs of third countries that are protected in the EU as a result of bilateral arrangements, as well as some 40,000 entries showing the protection of the EU GIs worldwide. So not only are we giving transparency to EU GIs on the single market, but we are providing for very needed visibility on the global market. I would encourage you to explore the tool for yourself. GIVU is an impressive tool, which not only gives this transparency, but it also promotes the geographical indications and allows the producers to pin themselves on the map. We are currently providing training to the national authorities to be able to make full use of the tool as GIs are precious national assets and a source of identity and pride that must be protected. The tool, apart from the official data from the register, gives the opportunity to national authorities and the producer groups to send a clear message to the consumers and the control authorities of their presence. For example, it allows for photos of the products to be uploaded and the localization on the map to be actually included. The visibility is in that sense instant. The office will continue to promote the tool as we strongly believe that it is a powerful legal but also promotional tool that was needed to strengthen the geographical indications as intellectual property rights. The GI view is a good step forward and an important result of our cooperation. However, even though this cooperation has grown in recent years and is proving to be very useful for stakeholders and users alike, everyone would agree that there is always room for improvement. It is clear that we need to continue to cooperate to be able to ensure the fruitful coexistence between different IPR rights, including geographical indications. As has been noted in the past by the European Parliament and others, while the EU has a registration system for foodstuffs, wines, aromatized wines, and spirit drinks, there is still no single registration for non-agricultural GIs, which still have to rely on different protections at national level in the EU. We are at the turning point for the future of the GIs in the EU, as we follow the evolution through the ongoing legal reform for both agri and non-agri GIs. The reforms of any kind always heavily depend on intensive input and consultation of stakeholders. The EU IPO is following this process with great interest and allowing itself to be a helping hand and providing support to the EU institutions as need may be. The EU IPO prides itself in being the center of excellence when it comes to intellectual property rights and hopes to be in position to help even further the process of strengthening GIs as valuable rights in the EU and beyond. It is our joint task to see GIs emerge even stronger at the end of this process, being important to so many countries, regions, and above all, producers. And finally, and if you allow me, I will conclude by citing the words of the executive director who always emphasized that the EU IPO remains ready to support any move in the IP area if the legislators believe we can add value and make contribution to jobs, growth, and social cohesion. And by this, I will thank you and I will thank Portugal and the organizers for this conference. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katerina, for such a good in sharing a good presentation in sharing your knowledge and perspective the, of the UIPO with our audience. We now enter the second panel of this webinar, 
will focus on non-agricultural geographical indications which have been under discussion for the purpose of creating an UI system for the protection of geographical linked industrial and handicraft products. To, to talk about the effect regarding non-agriculture GIs, we'll have the contributions of INTI's Director of the Extinction Right of Rights Directorate, Rui Solnada Cruz, followed by Fernando Gaspar, coordinator of the Department of, for Promotion of Arts and Crafts of the Portuguese Vocational Center for Arts and Crafts, CEAR. With further, further ado, please welcome Rui Solnada Cruz and Fernando Gaspar. The floor is yours. Rui, you can start, please. I have some problems with my presentation. I don't know why. Are you seeing it? Uh, Rui, estamos a ver. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm so sorry, I have a problem with my camera as well. Um, well, uh, before I deal with, um, with my presentation and uh, with the Portuguese experience, let me remind you the state of art in this matter. And uh, concerning the, non, uh, the non-agri GIs, we are not alone in this ocean. Internationally, Lisbon, we have Lisbon Agreement that includes the pleasures of origin for non-food products and 96 are already protected. We have the Geneva Act that is extendable to non-agri products. We have the Article 22 of the TRIPS Agreement that extends the protection of GIs to products in general. Uh, South and Central America have uh, 52 ge geographical indications for non-agri products. Uh, it's surprised as 120 GIs for non-agri products. In, uh, in, uh, in effect, India protects more in the crafts than uh, agri products. In the Ivory Coast, we have potential three non-agri products. And in Switzerland, we have 49 non-agri products. In the European Union, well, non-agri products are protected by some member states at the national level, as we know, following a non-harmonized system, some through geographical indications, others through collective trademarks. Everything started among us here in Europe in 2011, when the first step was given with the Commission publication, a single market for IP rights. In 2014, we had the Commission Green Paper and the results of its public consultation that came into light in 2015. And in this year, 2015, was the time of the European Parliament resolution of 6 October on the possible extension of GI protection of the European Union to non agri products. In 2018, we have the Directorate General for Internal Market launched the that launched the study on the economic aspects of two generous protection of non-agri goods in Europe. So, at this time, the European Union doesn't have for the moment a system for non-agri GIs, a uh, common system. The step was only done to agri products and foodstuffs, Regulation 1151 of 2012. However, European Union is working hardly on, on it. We are witnesses of that, looking for a common sui generis system. And we are uh, and already about 834 potential non agri GIs were already identified in the, um, uh, in the study made by Origin uh, in 2013. So, about Portugal, what can I share with you? Uh, the Portuguese law and non agri is more or less in, um, in the Portuguese IP code that contains some general provisions that shape a sui generis system applicable also to non agri. 
Uh, the Portuguese IP code states about the definition of GIs, uh, uh, speaking about any typical product, the proprietorship, individual or collective persons or corporate bodies, the capacity to request and acquire a registration, regional demarcation previously recognized by the responsible bodies, registration process, since the requirements for registration to the ground uh, for refusal, registration effects and invalidity and revocation cases. So Portugal is um, here in this, um, in this field is acting a little bit differently from France that uh, it has a specific law, law number, I guess, 2014-344, known by Loi uh, Benoit Hamon, that following some uh, provisions of the regulation 1151 2012 added some provisions to, the, to their intellectual property code as a result of some problematic cases against appropriation, such as, such as the Couteau de la Guiole and Savon de Marseille ones. This specific law, uh, law Loi Benoît, broke into light a higher protection against counterfeiting a transparent information to consumers and a consumer's protection against misleading. About our practice, if you wish to protect a non-agri um, geographical indication, you must uh, you must use that uh, link uh, uh, title over there and choose national appellation of origin geographical indication. After this choice, several frames will open successfully until you reach a final digital form. This final digital form shall contain the name of the persons who get the registration, identification of the product with the reference to geographical indication, and must be attached with a specification of the use of the geographical indication. Um, uh, as the same as, as, as uh, it happens with France with the Cahiers de Charge and in Italy with the, the Disciplinare di Produzione. Uh, so, in this specification, you, you will find the identification of the physical boundaries and the description and characteristics of the product in question. After that uh, uh, digital form is uh, has been presented to INPI. Well, application is made and some and the proceedings will start, followed by a formal examination, the publication of the application, the opposition, the examination itself, and the final decision of grant or refusal of non-agri geographical indication. Then you will find the publication of decision and the delay to appeal to court or to request invalidity of the decision will start running. Grounds for refusal, among others, we have the application is made by a person without the capacity to acquire it. The geographical indication does not meet the conditions to be protected as such. It may mislead the public in particular as to the nature, quality, and the geographical origin of the respective product, and it can cause some cases of unfair suspicion. What or which are the rights granted by registration? Well, the proprietor have the right to prevent the use by third parties in the designation or presentation of a product, the use that would constitute a case of unfair competition, the use by persons not authorized by the registration proprietor, the feature of the geographical indication word in any labels, advertising, or any documentation on products that do not come from the demarcated region, even if accompanied by qualifiers such as type, style, or quality. And of course, that the proprietor have the right to prevent the geographical indication from the cases of dilution by blurring or by tarnishment and parasitism when the geographical indications are prestigious ones. Some examples of non agri GIs protected here in the Portuguese IP office, you will find the Madeira embroidery, the lace from Ville de Conde, the black pottery from Bitalhães, and some figurine of Barcelos.
Portugal and non-agri GIs, why are they important to us? Well, non-agri GIs, accordingly to our reasoning, uh, protect tradition of some regions and the know-how of the people working there, remaking ancestral products that are part of our history and culture. People employment in some regions, promoting the economic development of these regions, so we can speak about the regional prosperity, consumers information, and the role of the products in both domestic and export markets. And as a result of that protection, GIs attract tourism and increase sustainability. Of course, there are some sensitive issues and these are the worst because uh, some people see uh, the graphic, graphical indications, non-average graphical indications protection as an obstacle to innovation. Well, we think that innovation is assured by another IP right and we should not mix patents and geographical indications. They protect, uh, they, they protect different realities. With innovation, we grab the present and the future. With geographical indications, we keep the past in the present. Are they descriptive? This is a very good inherent characteristics. They are seen as descriptive signs. And uh, when there is a fight between a, a geographical indication for non agri product and a trademark, we must take into consideration what is will of the trademark applicant in its application, in its trademark application. There is a terroir, well, this is the most controversial question and answer. The territorial link is essentially a human factor. The producer's traditional know-how and skills and, of course, reputation. And unless I'm mistaken, this link of handcraft with its artistic and traditional nature is shared by the regional laws of Abruzzo and Basilicata, and even regional laws of Toscana and Veneto in Italy, among others, state about historical and cultural heritage on the handcraft's profile. France, I suppose, considers the No, for the Portuguese IP office and European sui generis system for non agri GIs will be effective to protect them, especially in the digital environment, against counterfeiting and to ensure their enforcement. Thank you very much for your attention. I give you here my coordinates if you want to, uh, to ask some questions after this presentation. And once again, I'm so sorry for my camera doesn't work this time. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everybody. Can you hear me? No? Yes. Ah, okay. Thank you. Uh, well, um, first of all, uh, thank you for inv inviting Seart and myself to participate in this webinar that comes at a crucial time uh, for the development and affirmation of geographical indications in Europe. Uh, SEART is a professional training center specialized in craft and heritage operating across the country, which integrates the network of uh, Instituto de Emprego e Formação Profissional, Institute of Employment and Professional Training, and resulted from a protocol signed with Caritas of Coimbra. In addition to professional training, uh, we also develop activities to support entrepreneurs uh, and promote specific consultancy in the areas of management, digital marketing and innovation, closely supporting Portuguese artisans and craft products. SEART has been uh, working for 35 years in this sector, has integrated several European projects and has been represented uh, since uh, 2020 in the board of the World Craft Council Europe. Coming back to the theme of this panel, 
about non-agricultural geographical indications, I will speak about the Portuguese case. I will identify what is already working, the future perspectives, and also the crucial step of the European protection of geographical indications for non-agriculture products. Uh, the first non-agriculture uh, GI registered in our country was Bordado da Madeira, Madeira Embroidery, in uh, 1989, which we will hear about uh, today. Between uh, 2004 and 2007, in mainland Portugal, more precisely in the North region, uh, some pilot projects for the study and characterization of traditional products were developed. These projects resulted in the elaboration of specification documents of nine traditional non-agriculture products from the areas of embroidery, bobbin lace and ceramics, and the registration of GIs at national level in uh, 2010 and 2011. These pilot projects were carried out by city councils and local organizations, were fin financed by the operational program for the Northern region, and they allowed us to design the legal framework we have today. In 2015, the law that created the national qualification and certification system for traditional artisanal products was finally approved and allowed many other products to be registered as non-agriculture GIs. This system is coordinated by the Institute of Employment and Professional Training with technical support from CEARTE and covers traditional craft products that are part of the Portuguese cultural heritage and have a strong link to their territories of origin. The entities uh, promoting this uh, GI registration and certification processes uh, can be local authorities, producers' associations, or non-profit organizations working on culture or local development. Certification and control of the use of GIs is carried out by approved certification bodies. We currently have a certification body working in this area, ADER Certifica, which is based in Braga, but works across the country. Now, how does this uh, system work? First of all, the local entity prepares a proposal for a specification that proves the product's link to the ter territory. This document must, uh, must also define the characteristics of the product and the method of production, raw materials, and traditional know-how. This proposal is then evaluated by an advisor committee shared by Institute of Employment and Professional Training. And once approved, the local entity can register the GI at the Portuguese Institute of Industrial Property. So far, registrations, uh, so far 23 registrations have been made uh, through this system in areas such as embroidery, lace, ceramics, uh, filigree, tin, vegetable, vegetable fibers, and uh, musical instruments. And the, the specifications uh, of these products are available uh, on CEARTE's website as well as on other Certifica website. In addition, seven other products are under study now and about 60 more have been identified uh, for potential registration. In our experience, non-agriculture geographical indications are in fact a very important as asset for uh, territories. They represent the identity of the people and bring together decades or centuries of traditional knowledge. They contribute to increase the overall attributivity of a territory and to preserve local identities, 
with beneficial effects from a touristic, cultural, and commercial point of view. That's why the possible extension of geographical indications protection of the European Union to non-agriculture products is very good news, as it, as it will allow us to amplify the national protection to a legal protection in all the European area. We believe uh, it will be decisive um, since uh, it will allow for a better use of the potential of these products with benefits for producers and consumers. However, we believe that the following aspects should be considered. National systems uh, should coexist uh, with a uniform European system for the protection of non-agricultural GIs. Uh, in the other end, non-agricultural GIs already existing in member states uh, should have a simplified registration process at European level. Um, the link between products and uh, their territories of origin must be clearly demonstrated through bio bio bibliographic and documentary research. Uh, member states should have a significant role in the approval of the applications for registration at European level, considering their proximity and knowledge of the products, traditions and territories. It's important uh, that the European registration for, of GIs for non-agriculture products can be requested by producers, associations, but also by city councils. In fact, local authorities together with producers, seek to protect and promote these products, which are part of the cultural heritage of the territories. In the Portuguese experience, this possibility has been decisive for the number of non-agriculture GIs already registered. Well, I hope this information about our work was helpful, and I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Rui Solnada Cruz and Fernando Gaspar for both your remarkable lectures. We are aware there is, a, there is still a long way to go regarding non-agriculture GIs. To get to know a little bit more about the experience faced in the field, I have the pleasure to introduce the next two speakers will focus on the difficulties faced in Portugal concerning non-agriculture GIs. Mr. Paulo Barrios, head of division of the Madeira Wine Embroidery and Handicraft Institute, will focus on the famous Madeira's embroideries, and Mr. Daniel Martins, representative of the Gondomar local city, here to tell us more about the exquisite Mr. Paul Barrios and Mr. Daniel Martins, the floor is yours. Are you hearing me well? Sorry. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, please let me extend an, an special salute to, to, to all the participants here present. And um, please consider a, a special salute as protocol demands. Um, uh, also, let me uh, extend a or address a special thanks to, to the MP and you all uh, in the name of our uh, president of the IFBAM, uh, Engineer Paula Jardim. That wasn't, um, it 
that wasn't uh, here present to to share her knowledge and wisdom with, with us because of uh, her agenda. Uh, 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 so let me pre uh, talk a bit about Ivam. Ivam is the wine and uh, uh, wine and embroidery uh, institute for for the and and artisan for the artisanat for the Madeira Islands. Uh, we we are the entity responsible for the Madeira embroidery, I, and uh, for the archipelago, and um, it's a governmental institute. Uh, and uh, thankfully, since uh, 2006, we have the experience with both GIs, the agriculture and the non-agriculture. Um, I hope you are seeing my, my uh, presentation on the background. Um, uh, in, in any case, let, let's start a bit about um, seeing uh, where we stand. Uh, I will try to be as, as uh, brief as I can since we are uh, short on time. Well, uh, Madeira stays right here on this small dot. And if you are seeing, um, we, we are in the middle of the Atlantic, so our products are um, quite dear to us and represent uh, um, a way of living, a way of transmitting our, our identity, a way of preserving our cultural heritage. Our embroidery. Um, well, modern embroidery starts to take notice on the world since 1850. Oh, in the 1850, we, we, we made an uh, exhibition here on Madeira, on Palacio San Lorenzo. And we were always quite visited since we were a uh, uh, spot of passage for all, all main cruisers that came from the British Empire or, or, um, or uh, from other nations. Uh, so our products were always known and diversely uh, commercialized on the world. Uh, we started in 1850, but the embroidery was known, but non-commercial as it was. Uh, it was just uh, for families, from mothers to daughters, from daughters, from grandmas to 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 to, to her uh, next of kin. Well, uh, in 1850, after the exhibition, we went to. We were invited to be presented in the Great Exhibition of London in 1851. And since then, it started our our um, voyage in the the global world of, of uh, commercialization. Um, we can say that there were this this quite nice marks: 1850, 1851, 1854, which marks the first market, and it was the first market for us was England. Um, what, uh, uh, what, what, what uh, are we talking about? We are talking about this kind of words, works, uh, quite rich, quite unique, quite um, exemplifying of our identity and cultural way of seeing things, of, of preparing uh, tables, of preparing how to visit people. Um, but how did we protect it, this, this asset that we had, that once we had a, a down in the economy of the wine, that the mother wine um, represents a way of living for many families? Well, we started by 1935. Um, by 1935, we started by creating um, an organization for, for all the sector of embroidery, and we created the guild of the sector. And with this with this first law, we, we start by saying who was the producer, who was the worker or the artisan, and what was the product. But since 1938, I, I mean, just three years after creating the guild, we saw the necessity. We saw the necessity of creating a way of uh, authentication of our products in order to be able to sell them here in Madeira. 
Why? Because since we were a, 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 a well-visited place, um, it was usual to facsimile copies appear or non-quality products. And it's enough one bad quality product to, to uh, put down um, a good name, a trademark, a brand. So we started since 1938 recognizing the, the quality, the typicality and the origin of our products. Uh, after, after this law that we created here, um, we started to, to, to see uh, global changes uh, as we all did and the, the world stayed more global. And in that, in that case, we not only uh, not only uh, stayed with our uh, internal laws, but started to see which other mechanism existed. So we started by um, subscribing, uh, registering our de 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 or appellation of origin, um, Portado da Madeira. Uh, it, it, the registry st it started in 1985, which if them in 1989, we are the sixth uh, origin of uh, appellation for non-agricultural goods in in uh, in Portugal. We um, register a, a brand, not a, although it it gives less uh, less protection. It still protects the, the the name and the brand. So we start registering the brand also in Portugal, and then we start to register the brand in all the markets that we went, since they did not recognize appellations. We are in the uh, geographical indications. We, we start uh, uh, by at least protect the brand. So we have the brand protected in the United States in in the, all the, um, let's say, all the uh, markets traditional for us. But then we also introduce a seal, a quality seal. And we, we always try to keep the seal um, top with the state of the art of protection. We introduced an hologram in 2000, we introduced a serial number in 2014, and probably we are still looking for a, a, a newest Well, when we look back, um, this always were uh, uh, a very three factor important to us origin typicality and quality and and this was our first as you may see we started in 1935 and it was a, a, a continuous process first by regulating the sector and providing technical inspections to the products all the products are uh, inspected before being uh, introduced to commerce so we the institute with a, a technical panel check all the, 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 the goods and verify if they have the quality that it expect that is expected for, for this kind of work. We introduce the seal and we um, we uh, start for registration uh, appellations of origins and geographical indications. Uh, the the um, given the commitment the and when we noticed this, this was this were steps very important for our uh, stay on the market till these days. By defending our space in the local market, by a sui generis legislation, by um, defending our brand in foreign markets, and by um, uh, by the creating the, 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 the certifying and the, the technical panel that, uh, that verifies the quality of the products. These were steps very much important to keep, very important to keep us in the market till these days. In fact, I believe that, that if we did not register the trademark, uh, our brand in, uh, in the United States and other markets, probably other products of lower quality since today we have technology we have uh, proximity we have the other products would parasite as as said before parasite the the brand and and as we see them and and we'll take advantage of it 
just to be an, uh, to give you some example, here are some of the brand registrations that we have on some of the countries we do. Um, it, it, it's it's for us it, it's it's quite a pity thing that we do not have, um, let's say, an EU um, directive that allows us to, to to make this these registrations through all Europe since we have to pay them it eventually only as as a brand as we see here finland greece norway um, united kingdom sweden um, denmark i mean we we if it's very important to have a, a united front on the on this on this uh, uh, in these themes here we have the, the, the actual seal that we use on the Madeira embroidery. And as you may see, we are the sixth, um, sixth uh, um, DO uh, appellation of origin registers on Portugal. It was the IPTAM by the, those days, which was the Institute. And as you, as you may see, it's for, it dates from 1985. When we look back and, and uh, sorry for being this this uh, quick, but uh, since we are a bit delayed, I, I'm trying to be as, as short as I can. Uh, in our experience, uh, since we try to, to, to achieve this by mix, uh, by, by achieving the mix uh, uh, recipe of registered uh, appellation of, of, of origin where is, it is possible, or then at least the trademark, the brand, on those places that did not recognize them we may say that uh, it has been very very important this protection and um, although we have made a lot we can say that um, there are other steps that still have to be made it's important to register an appellation of our origin but then we have to protect how it is presented on the market and I'm talking on Portugal. Here in Madeira, we have a law that says that um, these kind of products have to be, uh, when presented to the public, when, when in commerce, should be um, well separated from others. And the, all the origins of products should be visible for the consumer. It's the right of the consumers to know the origin of the products that, that they are buying. And you may see it on the supermarket yeah. with the meats and the rest of agricultural yeah. products always tells you where the origin of the products is. But in, in a market that depends as much as, as tourism as Europe does, as Portugal does, as Madeira does also. And here we see it more fast because everything, of course, more fast on the island. Uh, it's easy for other products of low quality to parasite the, the brands. And uh, in commerce, they, they do not do the right separation of goods. If it's important to register an appellation and uh, e.g., it's also important to guarantee that in the market, they are not put together or mixed together with other products because other products will take advantage even if they do not use the name even if they do not try to be similar they take advantage of being in the same proximity and for a, a tourist for example it's it's a good that was right in the, in the, the same place so why not uh, buying one instead of the other well in in summarizing what we think it's more important which we what we think is the next step well, um, the, the protection and characterization of the traditional handicraft origin, typicality and quality, it, it's, it's, uh, on, it's on place. Uh, the valorization of the artisans is the right one. We can see it by CR, also Dr. Fernando Gaspar explained it quite well. We uh, subscribe all the words he presented. The teaching of the knowledge is safeguarded but uh, there are these, these uh, practices that, that, uh, that should be put on place. First of all, the discipline of the commerce practices for this kind of goods. All the, the goods that have uh, appellation of origins, IGs, should be uh, rightfully separated, rightfully exposed, uh, and um, 
the, the, the consumer should know the, those, those origins right away. We should reinforce Portuguese legislation in this means by the unequal, unequivocal and well expresses over origin of each good to be readable at the place of sale. It, it, it's a right of the consumer and should be reinforced. We have a law in Madeira that allows that and um, it's quite uh, interesting. Um, sorry. Um, we should uh, um, active surveillance of the products entering the European economic area. I believe this is more for the EU, but I could not let this opportunity go by without saying it. Um, it, 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 should not, it should be uh, seen how products and our economic space, particularly if they in some way attempt against our IGs and uh, uh, GIs, sorry, and uh, appellations of origins. Because um, even if that appellation of origin is not certified in another EU market or country, uh, it, well, uh, allowing it to enter it still makes uh, um, uh, damage. Um, reinforce the European legislation demanding for all European space and well, and well express its origin of the goods. I believe we could extend this kind of, of, of law. And of course, the, the directives that we were, um, or at least the, 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 the protections that, that were uh, in the past um, still making, uh, being worked to, to create a directive for um, non-agriculture, the appellations of origin and GIs, I believe we should put, a, put them in place. And I believe also that we should more actively uh, subscribe the um, Treaty of Lisbon of, for the international um, GIs. We should uh, be leading and uh, and um, and uh, um, preserving this cultural heritage that is for all. And as someone first on the panel said, we are not just protecting the products, we are protecting the investment made and, and the investment could be intellectual if we are talking of, of of, uh, for example, we saw it back there, the, the, the clothes of Vienna that are certified. We also have clothes, traditional clothes here in Madeira. And those, those are, are uh, investment of people, of knowledge, and uh, should be protected not only here, but in all the world. Um, uh, by this, I, I give my presentation ended, and I thank all of you for for your attention, for your time. And um, once again, thanks for this opportunity for us to share our knowledge with, with, uh, with the panel. If anyone has questions, we have um, experience that we uh, gladly uh, share with you all and, and present it if you still like it. Have you seen the presentation? Sim, sim, vimos a yes. apresentação. Obrigado so much. Uh, so obrigado a todos. Uh, não tinha certeza. I wasn't quite sure. I don't know if you um, have any question or if we still have time. I try to be as brief as I could. Good morning. I'm not hearing uh, it well. <coughs> Something. Anyone would like to, to share any new uh, information?
good morning. Thank you, Paulo Barrios, for your presentation. And now I'll give the floor, the floor to Daniel Martins. Please, Daniel, go. Good morning. Uh, first, I would like to greet all the speakers and the audience. A uh, big thank you to the organization, uh, to this opportunity to uh, present Filigrana de Portugal. Uh, it is an honor to be here, uh, share our experience, our difficulties, and also our challenges. I will start my presentation with a short uh, video. Okay, hope you enjoy it and want to learn uh, more about uh, filigree. I will now share my screen. Okay, so I'm representing uh, the municipalities of Gondomar and uh, Pobre de Lanhoz. These are two cities located at the north of uh, Portugal, and uh, they are the main production centers of filigree in Portugal. The two municipalities are united with the purpose of valorize craft skills, defending its producers, and protecting the manual production for industrial certification. Uh, the certification body is a DER Certifica, and the protection is held by the Portuguese Institute of Industrial Property. Some information about the production process. Uh, filigree is the art of obtaining and handling gold or silver threads, usually very, very thin, which are then applied to frames uh, with different shapes. Uh, it is a long way from the casting to the final product, combining hard work with subtle skills. Totally handmade, filigree is produced in small scale workshops using techniques passed down from generation to generation. Uh, in, the F, in the end, craft production uh, makes uh, each piece unique. Some of the stages of the production process, it all starts with the casting, melting gold or wires, uh, following by stretching the wires, welding, and then the most uh, artistic and delicate uh, task, uh, which is uh, filling the piece uh, one by one. Uh, I mean, one, one wire at each time. So for example, the, this image that you can see, uh, this heart will take about two hours, two and a half hours to, uh, until it's completed. These are some of the final uh, products, the, 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 the traditional uh, Portuguese filigree. About the certification, it is ruled by the Cree Law 121 from 2015 that defines the national systems of qualification and certification of traditional handmade productions. Filigrana de Portugal was officially certified in 2018, and it's a warranty given by the, the certifying organization, a DER Certifica, that guarantees that the product is made according to the specification book. This is a very important uh, document that characterizes the entire craft uh, production. 
This book uh, was a result of a profound investigation held with the support and with the agreement of established jewelers, uh, both in uh, the city of Gondomar as in uh, Povo de Nunes, which certified producer is assigned a punch and a label for placement in each certified piece. Uh, so it means that uh, every certified piece will have this label that you can see in the, in the image. The punch mark directly on the product and the label as a stamp of warranty proves to the consumer that this is a unique handmade uh, piece. The brand Filigrana de Portugal was registered in 2019 as a geographical indication because it is a countrywide denomination, meaning that all producers in Portugal who manufacture filigree according to the rules of the specification book that I was talking uh, earlier, are able to take part in the certification process and benefit from the status of the brand, therefore gaining reputation, support, and the quality that comes with it. Aims and benefits, uh, preserve culture and heritage, protect traditional techniques of Portuguese jewelry, value craftsmen, guarantee product quality, value markets, reinforce buyer's trust, national and international brand exposures, and increase competitiveness and reach new markets. Our main difficulties are uh, handcraft production is on the brink of extinction. The reality today is that uh, most of the artisans that work in this uh, activity are over 60, 70 years old. The industrial process is faster and profitable. Uh, we do have a problem with communication. We need to inform the public about the difference between certified and industrial products. Uh, they are often sold at the same price, so it means uh, it's an unfair uh, competition. And surveillance and inspection is a difficult task that requires uh, ex some expertise. Our challenges are to continue to support certified artisans. We need to do promotion campaigns with mainly two targets. The first target is the general public, as I was saying. We need to spread the word, choose certified filigree. And the second target uh, are jewelry stores that really can make a difference by separate filigree from mass production articles. Other challenges are explore new markets worldwide and approach the fashion industry. We also bet on sustainable and authentic tourism as a way of preserving and boost traditional workshops. The filigree route provides uh, visits to the workshops. Visitors can get to know genuine goldsmiths, their family history, and the entire manual process. Another huge challenge is the, the, to apply for UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage. We already done some uh, steps, but we still have a long way uh, ahead of us. Uh, for more information, please uh, consult our site filigranaportugal.pt. Here you can consult companies with certified production. Uh, this is my email, daniel.martins. Please be free to contact us. And uh, I would like to thanks again for the opportunity. Uh, I also invite you all to come and visit the filigree route. Uh, now that you know that you have to uh, choose certified filigree, so thank you so much for your attention uh, and hope to see you all soon. Thank you, Paul Pyrus and Daniel Martins, for letting, a know, letting us know the true difficulties you experience in the field. The sharing of experiences is certainly the best way to improve and constantly do better. Before giving the floor to the next speaker, I would like to ask the following speakers to try to reduce their presentations because we are a little bit out of our schedule. And now, 
to provide us with a better view of the new legal framework for protection of non-agriculture GIs, it is now my great pleasure to give the floor to Mrs. Claudia Martinez Felix, Deputy Head of Unit of DigiGrow at the European Commission, who will address the UI protection of geographical indications for non-agricultural products. Dear Claudia, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, uh, Maria Joao, and uh, I hope you can hear me all well and you can also see my presentation, uh, which is already open. So uh, I'm very pleased to give you a bit of a short overview because lots has been already said uh, about what's the state of play uh, of this situation and what is the Commission actually doing now, uh, what keeps us busy. Uh, to um, address the situation of non-agricultural products that, as uh, you know, have no uh, European scheme at the moment, uh, or no uh, sui generis scheme that uh, would cover these non-agricultural products. Sorry, Claudia, sorry to interrupt you, but we can see your presentation. Please, do you try? There's a problem with your screen. We are so, only seeing in blue, sorry. So you cannot see my presentation? Yes, yes. Okay. Maybe you can share, you aren't sharing the, the correct screen. Hold on, can, can you- Can you try to put it again? Okay, now it's almost there. Can you see it? Please, uh, half, half, the press, half the screen, sorry, Claudia. Okay, as you can see, I'm not the- Better to, to stop the sharing and try to do it again, please. Can you there's see a, it now? There's a, a black square in the middle of your presentation. Sorry. Okay. okay. Now we are seeing you. Try to do it to do it again, please. Okay. Is now is now I working? Know, yes. No. No. Oh, is still with the black square, sorry. That's strange. Okay, I will I will close it again and try to do it again, okay? Hold on. Okay, okay so. Um, let me see. Now it should work. Can you see it now? It's coming. It's coming, but not. Yes. No, no, no. The square, the black square is still on the screen. I don't know what is happening. Uh, okay, maybe it's because actually you are seeing. Hold on. Now? No, still. Okay, now. Well, almost there. Still. Uh, okay, now. Perfect. Yes. Thank you, Claudia. Okay, yeah. excellent. <laughs> okay, I will, since I've lost already two minutes, I'll go quickly into the first slide. So, uh, yeah, what I was mentioning is that, as you all know, we still uh, do not have at this stage uh, a European geographical indication uh, protection scheme for non-agricultural products. And I would want to bring at this stage a bit uh, what are the uh, main um, advantages that we have seen uh, popping up from the latest evaluation on the on the EU geographical uh, uh, system covering also agricultural products that have just been published in 2020, uh, and which um, have indeed pointed that since 1970, uh, since we do have the geographical indication scheme for agricultural products, we uh, have um, uh, been able to identify that there is a clear EU added value for having such a scheme at European level. And why? Because mainly, as it has been already said, it provides and it guarantees authenticity to consumers that are buying and that are interested in, uh, in such products. It actually increases transparency and it helps differentiating the value uh, of such products in the market, actually fostering uh, competition in, um, in, 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 in equal and fair terms. We uh, have also seen the 
the, 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 the linkage with um, the routing of the jobs that it creates in the specific uh, uh, areas and regions, uh, which are often also less developed or rural regions, and for which uh, boosting growth and employment is uh, obviously an a priority. And um, we also have seen along these years that it um, helps preserving the living cultural and gastronomic heritage of, um, of, 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 of those regions and also um, has given an added value, a higher value for uh, sales for those products also with, with leveraging their ex exports capacity. And I will uh, get back to that um, in its, um, in its, in, in its um, uh, potential uh, a bit later in my, in my presentation. So what um, we uh, have today, as I, as I mentioned at the very beginning, as you all know well, is, a patch of different uh, uh, um, systems at national level, whereby we do have uh, around 16 uh, member states in the European Union actually uh, setting up a uh, specific sui generi uh, uh, protection for uh, the non-agricultural uh, products. Uh, combined, of course, with agricultural uh, products, but other member states where they would opt rather for a protection which is based simply on uh, trademarks, for example, for such um, uh, uh, products. As you know, of course, at European level, uh, the use of trademarks for uh, trying to protect the uh, geographic, geographically rooted or, or linked uh, uh, product does not really match because the trademark uh, legislation today actually foresees uh, the protection and the, and, and, and the linkage to the commercial origin, but not to the geographical origin. So it is really not a system that is fit for purposes uh, to protect uh, products that are uh, uh, basically, uh, well, geographical uh, indicators are uh, products for non-agricultural products. So um, just to say that briefly, in the European Union, we have counted around 800 products that could qualify as, 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 as being uh, geographical indicators. And uh, I mean, you have here in this slide a beautiful uh, snapshot from uh, different countries, Poland, Belgium, you know, the Baltic Amber, the Antwerp Timons, the uh, uh, Belgium Dentel de Blanche, because uh, the, the, the protection of this, uh, what we call the non-agricultural products actually goes into a great variety of, uh, of sectors. Uh, we, we, we Clothings to building uh, materials, jewelry, uh, again textiles, furniture, uh, cutlery. I mean, you name it. This is very vast, and um, and again, um, what we have today as European system, it is only focusing on wines, spirits, uh, agricultural products, food stuff like cheese or fish products. I mean, we were uh, seeing many examples uh, earlier on in the, in the in the in the you know with the other panelists. But we, again, lack this possible EU GI protection for, uh, as I was mentioning, these non-agricultural products. Now, um, what is that we're doing you know, in this respect? We have been gathering many evidence since back 2013 with the first study, I mean, a legal study, now recently with the 2020 economic study that we have just uh, finalized. Also a lot of evidence from um, the report that the European Parliament uh, put forward uh, in, in, in 2019. And uh, we keep on gathering evidence, uh, but so far what we have seen is that actually these authentic geographical link non-agricultural products can be crucial for the European Union. And why? Because they are brands for our regions. And I'm not only talking about regions from the administrative, um, uh, let's say, uh, landscape at national level, but actually even uh, it, it can be of interest for cross-border regions that may, uh, may have actually developed uh, uh, an expertise in, in a specific product, uh, which comes from, 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 from that uh, uh, wider set, um, sense of region. And we have also seen that, uh, as I was mentioning before, there is a 
big potential for exporting such uh, protected geographical indication products because 84% of today's products are actually being sold not nationally only, but beyond in Europe on other European markets and even uh, for the, let's say, more high luxury like cutlery and uh, uh, a bit more pricey products that have been actually sold in, the, in other international markets like the Chinese or the US. So big growth exponential, you know, export uh, capacity. And we also see that they, um, these products promote the shared cultural heritage. And uh, on that one, I just want to flag the, the Portuguese example, uh, the Estremoz clay figures, which are since 2017 registered in the UNESCO representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. Now, we also sense that these products, if well protected at European level, can actually be the beating heart of our regional economy. And this links as well with the first uh, point I was mentioning, that is how much they root uh, uh, jobs and, and, and employment. And today we have uh, evidence that the producers of such uh, products are actually contributing to 1.6 million of equivalent full-time jobs in the European Union. So these are uh, numbers that with a wider uh, European uh, protection scheme can, in our view, uh, increase. Hence, um, also important uh, to frame this discussion in the, in the current context of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, because we see that these products are among the candidates to support recovery and resilience in the European Union. Um, they can promote the responsible and sustainable production practices that can match the EU objectives and visions for a greener and more technological developed uh, Europe. Hence, great potential again uh, at, at, at that front. If uh, we go ahead and look at what is happening uh, in the international level, I will not expand there because I know there are other panelists talking particularly on that perspective, but I think it is important as well to, to link uh, the current EU accession to the Geneva Act of the Lisbon Agreement, which has just entered into force um, uh, in, in, in past years, because it opens as well these opportunities for non-agricultural GIs, just to again make the point that we in the European Union are, let's say, the weirds <laughs> uh, taking a, 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 a different approach for non-agri and, and for agricultural products. That's not something you would see in other third countries' economies. So uh, what that brings us uh, for Europe, uh, having had this accession at European level to, to this uh, Lisbon scheme, is basically that it will allow, uh, once we have an EU uh, uh, scheme, to ensure that our GEIs are uh, protected. So in third countries and vice versa, we will be in a position to ensure that third countries, uh, non-agricultural GEIs are actually protected in the European market. Hence, again, lots of potential there. Now, um, going forward, what is, uh, again, that we are uh, currently uh, doing, you may have seen the Intellectual Property Action Plan that the Commission adopted uh, last November uh, 2020, where we have committed to uh, consider the feasibility of creating an efficient and transparent UGI protection system for these non-agricultural products. Uh, this commitment is basically being translated in a very busy team working on, a, on, on drafting an impact, an impact assessment where uh, we are uh, gathering all the different evidences that I was mentioning before, but not only, because we have also launched recently a study on control and enforcement rules of geographical indications for non rgis which uh, with the help of the contractors, uh, we will be able to finalize uh, before the end of the of this year. At the same time, we're also collecting stakeholder views uh, from, um, uh, from, from just recently, uh, two weeks ago, when we launched this public consultation with a lot of questions addressed to all the stakeholders. And I take here the opportunity to, to invite all of you uh, to, to fill in this uh, public consultation, give us feedbacks and also circulate it amongst your, net, net, your, your networks and, and interested stakeholders so that we gather 
uh, meaningful views that will help us as well to finalize and put forward um, a possible uh, uh, scheme for the European uh, uh, gathering the European basically dimension. Now, uh, this public consultation, just for your information, will be closed on the 22nd of July. Now, what are the uh, ideas we're having and which are being now explored, as you may have seen in the inception impact assessment, by the way, which was already uh, published uh, last November and for which the reactions were also published, um, is basically three uh, set of options um, which are reflecting the first feedback that we got already in the, on the basis of this inception in that uh, assessment, which is that we are actually gathering a broad support for a new initiative, but there are different views as to which is the best way to, to go about, because as I was mentioning and reflecting what the national reality is, uh, we have uh, some uh, member states, for example, and some stakeholders that may consider that, again, trademarks uh, uh, may be a, a good way uh, forward to protect uh, such type of products. Mm, we, that would require, of course, a change on the, on the trademark legislation, because as I was mentioning before, that's not fit for purpose today. There is also calls, for example, in extending the existing GI for agricultural products to non-agricultural products that also is um, uh, one of the possibilities we are uh, currently looking at. Um, although, again, it is important to bear in mind that agricultural products, of course, differ uh, uh, from the non-agricultural products, basically because they do are subject to different uh, uh, safety and health requirements, uh, which are not as stringent as they would be for non-agricultural products. Uh, and that's actually a result, I mean, a reality that we need to acknowledge. So. So um, we are studying the cost and the and the and the implications that that such route may have, and then of course uh, this idea of uh, simply setting up a sui generis regulation that would uh, have its own uh, procedure uh, uh, in place. Uh, obviously, always uh, taking into account that it needs to be the less burdensome and the and the less costly. Uh, and it has to be uh, effective uh, and close to the uh, to the users, to the producers, and the and the authorities that would be um, possibly overseeing such uh, schemes, as to ensure that it is widely used uh, and it brings results and uh, and benefits for 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 mainly producers and of course consumers. So these could be the three options that we are mainly uh, uh, considering. And, um, and with that, I would just simply also uh, close. Uh, we do think that uh, promoting uh, geographical indications for, um, for non-agricultural products can again be a game changer for the recovery, for the regions, and notably also if we look at the ecosystems more heated by the uh, current pandemic, if I'm thinking of tourism, for example, that can also be uh, a game changer for uh, boosting those regions where uh, tourism has unfortunately uh, uh, been, uh, and, and tourism services have unfortunately been uh, suffered uh, significantly. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Bye. Thank you, Claudia, for your presentation, which provided us with a clear image of the near future. And we now, and we now enter on the third panel of this webinar to talk about the internationalization of GIs and the effect of Geneva Air. I now give the floor to Mrs. Ale Alexander Grazioli, Director of the Lisbon Registry in the Brand and Design Sector, of the World Intellectual Property Organization, who has great expertise in the development and implementation of projects related with to GI. 
Alexander, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon to everybody. I hope you can hear me well. And I will, uh, without delay, start to share my presentation. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. So I would like first to, to thank uh, INP Portugal for having inviting WIPO and the Lisbon Registry to make a presentation on the new Geneva Act and the Lisbon system and uh, showing to you how this system can facilitate international protection of geographical indication from European country members but also um, worldwide because now the interest for geographical indication protection is really a global uh, tendency. So um, what um, we will discuss is really how to, to leave a national uh, protection and move to a global protection of your geographical indication. Different means exist internationally concerning the protection of uh, geographical indication. And what producer can do is to go individually country by country. Uh, the European Union has also negotiated uh, many bilateral uh, agreements. And also one interesting option is to uh, use the Lisbon system for uh, geographical indication of member of that system. The Lisbon system is governed by two different um, international instruments for the time being. So the Lisbon Agreement, as it was mentioned, negotiated in 1958. Portugal and several other EU countries are member of that system. And now we have the new Geneva Act who will slowly uh, replace the Lisbon Agreement and be the new version of the system. And as it was mentioned, uh, the European Union has joined the Geneva Act in 2019. So what are uh, the advantages of benefits of being member uh, of the Lisbon system and the Geneva Act? And what are the benefits for a GI producer? The Lisbon system is the only international registry that enable to protect your appellation of origin and geographical indication uh, in many countries through a single uh, registration procedure done by um, at WIPO. And what is important to keep in mind, and this was a will of the member of the system, is to have a very simple and accessible way of obtaining that international registration. And also what is interesting is that the Lisbon system is open to all kinds of products. So what is interesting by having this single international registration is that you don't have to follow the procedural rules, make translation of your application in different languages. If you go through a national route, because this can be very costly and time effective, with the Lisbon system, within one year, you can obtain a decision if your geographical in, uh, indication is protected in the other member of the system. What is also interesting uh, with the Lisbon system is that once registered a uh, geographical indication or appellation of origin, obtain an indefinite protection in all the other Lisbon member who has not issued a refusal without, uh, within the one year times I have to do it. Uh, and also anytime a new member joins the system, uh, the registration is extended to this new member without an active action by the producer. Um, and as long as the geographical indication is protected in the contracting party of origin, it uh, remains also protected in the other member of the Lisbon system without the need to renew it periodically. The level of protection offered to this geographical indication under the Lisbon system is uh, very high compared to international standard uh, protection against any imitation and usurpation. And it corresponds, if you look to the Geneva Act, to the level of protection that exists in the European Union. What is also interesting is that once a GI is uh, registered under the Lisbon system, it cannot become generic anymore in the member who have accepted to protect it. 
what was done with uh, the revision of the Lisbon Agreement with the Geneva Act was uh, to include a different flexibility in the system. The first main flexibility uh, is to recognize the possibility for member to decide uh, which is the legal system they want to implement at national level to protect uh, geographical indication. So it is done in many countries by sui generis system, but several of the member developed GI protections through trademark and both systems are now fully recognized under the Lisbon system. And there is also inclusion of different safeguards uh, for interested third party also to defend the right or use of some names in case of a new application in sent uh, to the member state of the Lisbon system. Just to summarize in brief uh, the process of application and registration. So what is important is to have a title of protection in the contracting party of origin. And with a title of protection, uh, the GI producer can ask their competent authority at the level of the European Union is the European Commission DG Agri. Uh, for Portugal and for the other individual country member of the Lisbon Agreement, is uh, the national authority uh, who is capable to uh, apply through the Lisbon system. WIPO make a formal examination of the international registration. And if all the conditions are met, uh, we register the geographical indication population of origin. Uh, we publish it and we notify it to all the different members of the Lisbon Agreement and or Geneva Act. And this country have one year to decide uh, if according to their national uh, legislation, they can accept uh, the protection of the GIs or there is a ground to refuse it. And so they can notify your refusal. Um, when they notify your refusal, they need always to explain what are the ground of refusal and also what, what are the legal means to uh, uh, ask for a withdrawal of the refusal. So, there is always a mean for GI producer also uh, to react against the refusal. Here is the uh, current forms to uh, registered uh, geographical indication under the Lisbon system. And here's a requirement. So you see very basic uh, requirement uh, because everything is based on the national original registration um, done previously. Here are some examples of uh, appellation of origin and geographical indication currently protected under the Lisbon system. And here are some examples from Portugal. We heard already of many of this wonderful product. Um, here gives you an idea. Who have filed more application for the time being under uh, the Lisbon system with France and Italy and Czech Republic as the main applicant. Uh, we will soon receive application from the European Union following their accession to the Geneva Act. But what is interesting to see when we speak also about internationalization of protection of, of GIs is to see the tendency also in the past 12 years from an increased number of applications from developing countries. Um, and if you look to the main applicants in the 12th past year, you have Italy as the first applicant, but also Iran, Georgia, Mexico, who are also among the biggest filer under the Lisbon system. And I'm sure that if we look this number in a few years, you will see different country being also a top applicant. So with the extension of the Lisbon system through the Geneva Act to the protection also of geographical indication, and with the accession of the European Union to the Geneva Act, we hope to have much more uh, products from Europe protected in future. And here are just some examples uh, of potential products that could be protected. And as mentioned, the Lisbon system is also open to non-agricultural products. If you are interested in having a look to current registration, you can go on the Lisbon website and consult the Lisbon Express database or the bulletin. 
And we are developing uh, new uh, services for users of the system through the YPYP portal and, and uh, enabling in future uh, e-filing application and also a more modern management of portfolio of registration. So this is work in progress, but we hope that by the end of this year, beginning of next year, uh, user of the system could be able to benefit from these new services. Uh, just some uh, information about the current progress and how the Lesbian system become more and more a global system. So as it was mentioned, uh, the Lisbon Agreement um, was revised through the process that started in 2009 because the member of the Lisbon Union uh, decided to make the system more attractive to new potential member, more flexible, but also preserving this principle and objective of creating an efficient protection and an accessible and simple way to obtaining that international protection. And in 2015, the Geneva Act was adopted in a diplomatic conference in Geneva. Since then, uh, several members have started to accede or ratify the Geneva Act, among them Cambodia, Albania, Samoa, and DPR Korea. And the fifth contracting party joining the Geneva Act was the European Union in 2019. And this succession enabled the entry into force of the Geneva Act in February last year. Since then, we have new members uh, who joined uh, the system, so Laos, France and Oman. And uh, here you can see the variety um, of country from different regions also interested in obtaining protection of their GIs through the Geneva Act. And uh, uh, here you can see uh, the list of members of the Lisbon Agreement and Geneva Act. And what we see now with current members of the Lisbon Agreement is that they are in the process uh, many of them to accede to the new Geneva Act, and soon the Geneva Act will really be the main version uh, of the treaty governing uh, the Lisbon system. Uh, here you can see uh, some countries in the process of accession. So the European Union has joined, but uh, the current seven members uh, that are member of the Lisbon Agreement, and we heard also uh, before I mentioned uh, from uh, Ms. Bandeira, that also Portugal is in the process of accession and should exceed this year. But we have also countries such as Switzerland, Russia, who are in the process of exceeding, Jamaica, and also uh, African um, member of the Organization of uh, the Intellectual Property of Africa, and Capo Verde also present uh, with us today. Why is this uh, increased interest and global interest for GIs? It was mentioned by different speakers before me, Spe because geographical indication has a real potential to foster local development. I will not go into many detail. Speaker before me have, have mentioned it, but I will invite you if you are interested to see some interesting story that were published um, uh, last year. Uh, for the World IP Day, who was on a green development. Uh, some of these GIs are also protected under the, uh, the Lisbon system. And we we'll see also now an interest by new country. Um, let's say, take the example of Arab country from the Gulf region, and with the accession also of Oman, of an increased interest of using GIs to recognize and valorize emblematic product and local tradition. So um, what we hope and we think in WIPO is that the Geneva Act has the potential to become a global system to protect GIs. If you are interested in obtaining more protection, I invite you to register to our newsletter, follow our webinar and see general information on our Lisbon uh, webpage. We have also published some interesting information and have testimony. Uh, from SMEs also, who are behind most of geographical indication protected in Europe. And we have also published some tips for them concerning the use of the Lisbon system. I would like to stop here and thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Alexander, for sharing your valuable experience in the WIPO point of view. As we end, we enter our fourth and latest panel of this webinar that is also dedicated to the world's incredible heritage. It is also time to devote our attention to GIs outside the EU. To talk about the perspective of a country with a large dimension and such a rich and diversified heritage, I now offer the floor to Mrs. Patricia da Silva Barbosa, representative of the Brazilian Institute of Industrial Property, PhD in Trademark and Geographical Indications. Dear Patricia, the floor is yours. Bem-vinda. Greetings to you all. I hope you are listening to me. Yes, we are. I hope you can see my, my presentation. Yes, Patricia, we can see. You can move forward, please. Thank you. I'll present a very briefly timeline of how Brazil protects GI. But first, since we are going to talk about origin, I'd like to show you where Brazil is located. Brazil is the largest country in the South America. We have continental dimensions, several types of climate, and many different cultures and traditions. Here, GIs began to be protected as industrial property assets in 1997, when the industrial property law came into force in the country. The place where I work, the Brazilian National Institute of Industrial Property, is the institution responsible for the analysis and granting of GIs, as well as trademarks, patents, industrial designs. I'd like to highlight three important differences between GI protection in Brazil and in the European Union. The first difference is that we protect as GI only geographical and gentlemanly names, such as Portuguese, French, and Italian. The second difference, very briefly, is that our GIs are divided into two species, indication of provenance and denomination of origin. The Brazilian GO concept is similar to the European one, but our indication of provenance concept is not comparable to European PGI. Our indication of provenance is related to geographic areas that have become renewed. And in Brazil, there is no legal determination about which steps of the production must take place in the delimit area. The third difference is that Brazil protects agricultural and non-agricultural products, such as handcrafts, ornamental rocks, live animals, and about GIs, I refer to geographical names protecting Brazil as indication of provenance and the denomination of origin without divide them. 10 years ago, we had only 11 GIs registration for agricultural products and three for non-agricultural products. Our first GI was Vale dos Vinhedos for wine. In the same decade, we granted Paraty registration for cachaça, our most famous alcoholic drink. There is a registration of goiabeiras, a type of clay steel pot with a very typical shape and color used to make traditional dishes. We also had a registration for Região do Jalapão do Estado do Tocantins for handcrafts made with golden grass, a kind of plant that naturally has an amazing color, golden color that looks just like gold, as you can see. In 2018, Bra Brazil published a normative ruling to regulate the GI's registration, which brought relevant change introduced the possibility of amending the registration and limited the use of the GI to those who are in the limited area, follow the technical specifications and submit themselves to the control stipulated by it. Now, at the very beginning of this year, the first Brazilian GI manual was published, a project I have the opportunity to participate in. 
the manual was detailed relevant information and general provision on GIs. Another relevant fact was that both documents were privileged to be submitted to public consultation. It was an opportunity to society and from public and private institutions to comment on the proposals submitted. Nowadays, Brazil has 69 GI registration for agriculture and 18 for non-agricultural products and one GI for service, this one. The Brazilian service GI is called Porto Digital and was granted for information technology services in 2012. It should be noted that this GI is for software development services and not for software products itself. An interesting fact about the GI is that it's located in the historical center of the state capital of Pernambuco, which is known as Recife. You probably noticed that our GIs contain images. In Brazil, images can be protected together with the geographical name as graphical representations. Although it's optional to insert a graphical representation, it's common to see Brazilian GIs with their own graphical representations. In general, they refer to the place of origin or the GI product. In the case of Porto Digital, the GI has a figure that highlights the typical historical architecture of the region associated with modern buildings. Porto Digital is a triple helix model example where government, universities, and companies act together. Currently, Porto Digital houses 300 companies and institutions of information and communication technology and city technology sectors. It has three business incubators, two business accelerators, and six research institutes. More than 9,000 qualified professionals work over there. Although the region is strong in information technology market and Porto Digital is without a doubt a relevant location, unfortunately, the GI is not widely publicized. An academic study has shown that one of the main problems for the development of the GI was that private commercial interests make it difficult to promote a sign of collective use and its collective interests. Porto Digital is the only registered GI for service in Brazil but a second GI application for service was failed last month. Now it's Litoral do Paraná for a gastronomic service. The second case that I bring to you is GI Pirenópolis. Pirenópolis is a small town in the countryside of Brazil. The art of jewelry began there around the 17th with the arrival of a group of people who chose the region to create an alternative community. The place is known for having a strong mystical energy and there are even pieces that are called magical jewelry. Pirenopolis was registered as a GI for handmade silver jewelry in 2019. Currently, the city has about 100 artisan jewelers. This image shows some of the pieces produces, produced in the region. You can see the beauty and delicacy of the jewelry that has given the place a reputation. This last picture is of a necklace that opens to store aromatic leaves of flowers. The artisan who produced them has a store called Silver Magic. Very, brief, very briefly, these are some examples of Brazilian GIs. As we can see, it's been only 24 years granting protection. There are several challenges facing the Brazilian GIs. The participation in webinars like this, which allow the exchange of experience, is a relevant learning moment since we are in practical experience. Thank you so much for, for the opportunity and your attention. Thank you, Patricia, for sharing Brazil's perspective and reality as regards GI. To finish our fourth and last panel, 
Let us now hear the contribution of Mr. Ailton Pavard Dalfama, representative of quality management and intellectual property of Cape Verde and member of the working group of Appalachians of Origin for the Wine of Fogo and Xandas Caldeiras in Fogo Island, Cape Verde. Mr. Ailton Alfama will provide us with an overview of the, the geographical indications in Cape Verde, more specifically the case Vinho do Fogo. Mr. Ailton, the floor is yours. Bem-vindo. Mr. Ailton, we can see you, not oh. neither hear you. I will listen okay. to you first. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you. But we can see you. Do you can see me or, yeah. or not? Ah, okay. Is no, it... we can see you. We can see you. Okay. We can. And do you can see my okay. presentation? Now, yes, now we can see you and hear you. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, uh, good morning to all. Uh, first of all, uh, I, would, uh, I will say thank you for the, to ANP uh, for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure for me to, to participate and share the, ex the Cap Verde experience at GI. Um, uh, I will I will close the the, uh, the web uh, the webcam uh, and I will share the, the my presentation. Uh, uh, for this uh, presentation, I will speak a little, uh, a little about the Cap Verde Wine Origin, uh, the Fogo Wine Project, and the characteristics. Uh, but um, before proceeding uh, with the presentation, I will need to point out uh, to say uh, this project had led by a recognized expert uh, in Chai um, here uh, present. Uh, he was a, a speaker uh, uh, to, uh, in this webinar, Professor Ribeiro Delmeide, as a wipe consult, uh, who, who knew so, so well to lead this project and draw up the specification of the fog wine. And certainly he had uh, a lot, uh, he has a lot uh, uh, to share about this experience. Uh, so, the Fog Wine, the Fog Wine project, the phase and the one theater uh, to appellation of origin and the wine characteristic. The wine. Uh, uh, pass to the first, uh, first point of the outline. I must tell the, the cultivation of vine uh, in Cap Verde dates back to the 16th century uh, when it was introduced by the Portuguese in the five isles of the 10 isles uh, Cap Verde Island. Uh, but uh, it was on, on the four island that the cultivation was most uh, successful uh, due to uh, is natural uh, potential. Uh, in the 17th century, the wine production developed uh, and prospered in the main um, wine growing uh, region, uh, namely in Saint Antão and Fogo. Uh, so during that century uh, and beginning the 18th century, it was already exported mainly to Guinea-Bissau and Brazil. Uh, the, after the short uh, historical review about the Cap Verde wine, uh, Cap Verde wine origin, allow me to share a little of our experience. Uh, 
when we request uh, from white white technical assistance to recognize some cap verde uh, typical product as GI and protect the geographical name uh, to value work products, uh, we had proposed a list of national products. However, the fog wine by its story uh, and presence in the market uh, had the priority. Uh, that is, uh, we will hold be in the presence of an, an existing product uh, in the market, with story, unique, uh, with enormous potential uh, that it was uh, necessary to protect the geographical name. Even, uh, so the, uh, even thing so, uh, the imitation and the vulgarization, and perhaps to that it be lost. Uh, so thus, uh, yeah, this, uh, with the support of uh, WIPO, the project for geographical indication for the Fog Island uh, wine was launched by EGKPI, uh, where we were uh, are involved also institution with authority in the uh, in that matters such as uh, general direction uh, direction of agriculture, the producers group, uh, and the National Institute for Agrarian Research and Development. Uh, This project was programmed to be conceived in three phases. The, the first was planning and, and the launch of the project. Uh, the second, developing DGI. And the, the third was um, geographic indication application. So the first phase was to socialize the project uh, as well to to characterize the, the product, uh, in, namely in analytical and characterization of an elect and the, the story uh, of part. Uh, uh, the second phase was to formalize the creation of the local group uh, of operators uh, for wine and the vocal, vocabulary development to describe the specific quality of the for wine. The third phase was to revise and uh, complete uh, uh, the specification of, of GI for Gu and the Shandash Caldeas uh, and prepare the application for the uh, GI resistation. So for uh, this project initially <laughs> should be concluded uh, with one geographical indication. Uh, uh, for, 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 but what we found on the ground uh, ch changed what had initially been proposed. Uh, and, and the outcome uh, was two, uh, two appellation of region, uh, Fogo and Xandas Caldeiras Vinho do Fogo. This is because the, um, the producer argued that the link between uh, the product and the region uh, of a region holds hold, uh, justifying uh, uh, that they are, were an appellation of origin. Uh, so, um, likewise, uh, the thinking, uh, taking uh, the particularity of the Chandas Caldeiras wine, it's concluded uh, it would be better to have two appellations of origin. So, uh, we have uh, one territory uh, with two appellations of origin. The appellation of origin of folk. Uh, the geographic delimitation was the whole of the island, and the appellation of origin Chandas Caldeiras uh, Vineyard Folk, uh, geogra the geographical delimitation uh, is the natural park of Folk and uh, the some re near uh, re regions, just like uh, Helva and uh, Ashada Grande. So, this is uh, the two appellation origin. Uh, from Cap Vert, the Chandas Caldeira Vinho de Fogo and Fogo. Uh, the natural, the characteristics, uh, moving to the, the, last, uh, the last point of the outline, 
it is important to, to note that uh, the characteristic of a fog wine with uh, the territory is due to two factors, uh, the natural and the, the human. The influence of natural factors uh, of the characteristic uh, of fog wine, it is a volcanic uh, or clay soil, uh, a grave stone, uh, uh, and the extreme temperature. Um, Maybe so. With uh, uh, so the the plantations uh, is above uh, one thousand meters of uh, altitude. Uh, the uh, the particle of culture is the conical shaped mountain uh, in the active volcano. Uh, so the four winds are the result of the combination of cells interconnectors uh, factors that result in the production of specific uh, wines uh, rec uh, of recognized uh, prestige. Uh, a long start of uh, wine production in the fog, in Chandes Caldeas in the fog is associated with the climate, uh, the geomorphology, endophology, and the uh, insularity. Uh, the, uh, so uh, the, the influence of the human factors uh, on the characteristics of fog wine, it's a circular know-how set in the ash and the volcanic la landscape. Uh, the producer know-how is manifested uh, in the use and the transformation of the, the grapes from various tradi traditional uh, variety. Uh, the men, in fact, the, the men know uh, New, the new, the man knew how to adapt the vine to the soil, uh, the windows, and the aridity. Uh, we knew the, they know how to adapt the, the vine uh, to the soil uh, to, to take advantage of the richness of a unique soil and produce a unique wine. Without uh, this, this know-how uh, acquired by tradition uh, and the tradition of it. Uh, the wine in Chandes Caldera and the wine from Fogo would not exist. The quality, the quality and the uh, characteristic was uh, was is, is exclusive to the geographical uh, environment. Uh, so the vine of fog uh, is a unique and a distinctive quality, a qualitative uh, and organolytic characteristic that uh, discerning it from the other uh, other wines. Uh, it is in the in its color, uh, texture, body, and aroma, or its uh, physical chemical characteristic. Since the uh, the alcohol title of the grape and to the uh, to the wine, this characteristic are due to the dry climate, uh, very very cold during in the winter nights, and very hot during to the summer days. Uh, the relations. Um, the relationship between the characteristics of the geographical of the geographical uh, geographical area and the wine quality, well, does uh, does a characteristic have generated since the beginning of the painting of the vine on the idol? Specific specific cultural practice to adapt the vineyard uh, to the geographical environment. Uh, this set a, a factor uh, mean that the fog wine enjoy a unique personality uh, marked by the their alcohol content and the aromatic uh, aromatic characteristic uh, uh, derived in the particular from the variety used and adapt uh, to the soil uh, and the climate characteristic which characterize uh, characterize the different from the other other wine. So, I will to conclude uh, my present uh, my presentation. Uh, allow me to share some image in the, of the fog wine 
uh, wine appellation origin and uh, an invitation to visit Cap Verde and discover the wonders of each island. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your important contribution, Ailton Tavares of Hama, and for sharing the very interesting Vin do Fogo experience. We are now at the end of this webinar, and I would like to thank our speakers on behalf of Kinti for all your insights, insightful speeches, which provided us with a wider view on the subject of geographical indications and the importance of internalizing a knowledge that has prevailed of often throughout the centuries and must not be lost. Protecting such heritage, adapting it to modern life, making it safe, creating and securing jobs certainly crucial is certainly crucial for one of the oldest country state in the world, Portugal. For the closing session, it is my great honor to offer the floor to the Secretary of State for Justice, Mrs. Annabella Pedroso. Dear Secretary of State, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, um, dear President of the Portuguese uh, Institute uh, uh, of Industrial Property, Ana Bandeira, uh, dear Presidents of the Wine and Vine um, Institute and Institute of Douro and Porto Wines, dear EU IPO and EU representatives, dear speakers, um, dear participants. Making beforehand a promise that I won't be very long in this conclusion remarks, let me just begin by stating what we already know that geographical indications truly matter. And so my first words are to thank you all for having joined us. Your participation is a real testimony of the importance that so many countries around the world give to this matter. I also thank the speakers for accepting our invitation and being here to share with us their expertise and great work in this important field. And it's symbolic, despite being a virtual mode, that we are today speaking from Lisbon, the city that hosted the signature of the Lisbon Agreement in 1958. And this webinar, organized under the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union, is the expression of the Portuguese government commitment to continue promoting and actively cooperate in the development of the Lisbon system. And as it was in the past, it will be today, is today, and will be in the future. But about the Geneva Act of the Lisbon Agreement, signed by Portugal in 2015, it's a pleasure to inform you all that uh, uh, the ratification of the process is uh, an ongoing process. So let me only start by saying some, a few words about what is going on today. Portugal, as many other countries, facing the great challenge of competitiveness and export growth, is firmly committed in promoting the use of IP tools to protect value-added and traditional goods, which are crucial to facilitate the access of our, of our companies to the global markets. The appellations of origin and geographical indications are definitely key instruments for the purpose of differentiation of the goal in the global markets, being a major IP asset for businesses and playing an increasingly role in the, role in the world trade. The growing importance of GIs, not only as an economic tool, but also as a social and cultural boosters, demands strong legal instruments able to ensure that they deserve a suitable international protection against misappropriation and unfair competition. We all know that the challenges that we face, even inside our countries, when it's not completely understood the importance of not letting die the interest and continually promote our regions, our traditions and our products. And in this way, it is important to highlight that one of the priorities of the Portuguese presidency is to raise awareness about the 
the scourge of counterfeiting, that has become more and more real, taking on forms that are increasingly difficult to detect, prevent, and punish, threatening products and protected by GIs. So, dear participants, during this morning, several were the contributions that result from this stage of debate and reflection on this theme. Today, we had the opportunity to hear about agricultural geographical indications, more specifically about the Portuguese GIs in the wine sector, and some case studies like the designation of origin of Lorinha. And in the topic of non-agri GIs, we heard about the main difficulties that they are facing, such as filigrana and Madeira embroidery. And again, we heard about the challenges that the globalization of markets brings to the protection of national products against imitations across borders, not only raised within the European Union, but also in such countries such as Brazil and Cape Verde, Cap, Cap, Cap Verde represented here today, that I um, give a um, olá e um obrigada uh, muito forte. Please forgive me to speak in Portuguese. But in conclusion, we shared good practices and ways to move forward in the protection of GIs. But in the end, in the end, we all agree that it is up to us not only to keep the path of preservation of this cultural heritage, but also to perfect the ways of protecting these products. And so, dear participants, I think that my last words are to say something that it's common, it's common sense. But again, I think that it's important to emphasize that the past is set and the world is our natural habitat. And let's use it with respect and gratitude because this is our common heritage for future generations. And this should be our common commitment. And so thank you again and very much. And thank you very much for your attention and for being in this webinar. And um, the only thing that I can add and can say is all the best for all of you. And hopefully in the future, we will be together shaking hands and being close one each other. So thank you and keep safe. Dear Secretary of State for Justice, as always, was a great pleasure insightful intervention the webinar geographical indications the eternalization of the knowledge which is its end thank you so much for your attention i am certain that we all know understand the importance of protecting protecting the geographical indications which are also a reflection of our own pride as humans who hold such a diverse and rich heritage, which must be eternalized for the sake of generations to come. And to finish with Im images of our beautiful country, we will see and hoping to see you soon. Thank you for your attention.
it's quite quite a nice film about the beautiful of Portugal, and it was made by our tourism of Portugal to promote our country around the world. But unfortunately, due to technical So voyage out, let the wind blow through your sails, explore, dream and discover. Believe that that sky is going to seem that bit blue. How many times have you left early, cancelled a meeting or otherwise changed your plan? How many times do you find yourself staying? when you say you're going. How many times have you thought about starting over, but said to yourself, well, perhaps I'm a stayer, not a go. How many times did you look at yourself from another perspective and grasp, when all was said and done, you were simply in the wrong place? This is the moment to seek out new views and angles. We're the same size as what we see and not what we have. We may not all speak the same language, but we do all speak with the same tongue. The good news is they are still here. These landscapes do persist in the three-dimensional world that we exist, and they do hold the capacity to transform us. So come, take a look, but look to see and not to show, and save it right here and here. Put the phone away and go. You like your passport best. Just remember that no matter how many years we are granted, and however wise, however much dust has settled in our eyes, we still don't know just what they might be next. Two meter roller or a 30 meter breaker. I see the misprinters. So voyage out, let the wind blow through your sails. Explore, dream, and discover. Believe that that sky is going to seem that bit bluer. It's not the time to take your bow. Past is behind, the future ahead. What we have is this great moment now. Keep this in your head. It's the truth, and this is the proof, and it's with us each and every day. We just have to read the signs. The train a la passes once. We can't skip new ideas. We can't skip new beginnings. Because after all, we can't skip life. Thank you so much once again for your attention. If please visit Portugal, you can uh, keep us, uh, you can keep Portugal. You are always welcome. Thank you.